Okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, there's about 76 participants in this, uh, in this Zoom meeting. So uh, I suspect a few more will be, uh, uh, will be joining us gradually over the course of the next few hours. So good morning, everyone, or uh, uh, you know, from wherever you are, we are extremely excited to have you here for, uh, for the first ever Python Foam workshop. Um, hosted virtually at Argonne. Uh, uh, and um, I, I'd just like to uh, you know, um, you know, mention the fact that we have uh, attendees from all around the world. I'm, I've heard that there are about 300 plus registrations from um, more than 10 time zones. So I'm really glad that you've shown interest in this, uh, in, in our work and, and are joining us here. Uh, so this is uh, this is a uh, this is the first time we're offering a workshop like this. So we are going to be a little, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'd say we have to do a little bit bit of ad libbing. So we are going to be creative and and potentially run into problems and hopefully with your help uh, surmount them as well. Uh, and I'd like to thank my uh, co-instructors. You know, their names are listed on the slides over here. Uh, who have been very helpful with this research as and as and, and for this um, uh, for the, and for the preparation of this workshop as well. Okay, so uh, here's some information for um, for everyone who has already joined us. So as you know, we are a big proponent of. I mean, we are using OpenForm as you might know. So OpenForm is all about uh, open source, a uh, community-based approach to research and development. So all our code is available on GitHub. Uh, and uh, specifically for this particular workshop, we've also spent some time in constructing what is a Docker container. So we'll have details on this in a while, uh, which essentially lets you um, uh, ignore all the pains you may have with, uh, for example, in the installing OpenFOAM, which is not easy. Uh, and and just getting into the code and getting some some neat little examples going right. So most of you are already on the Slack channel. Uh, you know the, the purpose of using Slack for this workshop is uh, is of course uh, a platform for spreading information, getting to know each other. But uh, I, I'd like to keep that Slack channel going after the end of this workshop. Uh, we are not trying to uh, have this uh, workshop as a one time thing. We want a community to grow around this code. Uh, and to uh, really um, essentially collaborate with each other, hopefully going, uh, going forth. Uh, instructors will be monitoring channels and there, I have also left some instructions there for different people. So uh, feel free to, to leverage these channels as much as possible. I, I mentioned this right before we started, but use the random channel to introduce yourself, your affiliation, you know, anything that is of interest, uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, to this workshop or otherwise, uh, uh, in, in a lot of the workshops that I've uh, visited, uh, I've met some very interesting people who have turned out to be very, very good collaborators. So I, you know, I'd be extremely happy if this workshop enables something like that. And finally, I'd like to really thank our uh, wonderful uh, administrative uh, uh, staff over here, Kathy, Julie, and Linda, for really, uh, you know, helping this, uh, helping us get this. Uh, deployed this this particular workshop um, uh, so a special thanks to them for all their hard work um, i'll also i guess get started with uh, briefly introducing the agenda for uh, for our um, uh, discussions today uh, so as, and before i go into the agenda i'd just like to request the members of the audience to uh, to keep their videos off and and themselves muted uh, since we have such a large number of people who are uh, going to join us, hopefully uh, even more than, than we have now in, in the Zoom session, there may be uh, connectivity issues. Uh, uh, there's already 93 people, there's another six in the waiting room. So we, we really, uh, we're excited to have a lot of you here, but we also don't want anybody to miss out on any of the fun. Uh, Slack is your friend, so questions, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, would be best served on Slack. Uh, if at all you have a pressing question, then no problem. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, ask it. But uh, uh, you know the idea of Slack is that things are are going to be saved long term. So, uh, so that's just uh, uh, just a pointer. 
And so the agenda of, of, of today's uh, discussion, so we have uh, about four hours, but uh, what we are trying to do is not fire hose the members of the audience with information. So we don't want to dump a lot of information on your head and have you digest it, but, uh, but mainly take, take it nice and easy. Uh, so we have left enough time for interactive sessions between the instructors on Slack and in Zoom. Uh, and, and also uh, you know, spend enough time for you to actually run some of the code at your end on your machine. Um, uh, the, the overall agenda, and, and we'll have plenty of breaks in the middle where you can catch up in case you feel that you've been left behind. Uh, so uh, so uh, it's gonna be nice and calm. Uh, overall, what we are going to do is, is we are going to have an introductory type of session, which I've just started. This will be approximately half an hour. Uh, we'll have a break after the first half an hour where you can collect your thoughts, um, maybe use that time to, again, get to know each other and, and you know, uh, uh, put down some preliminary questions in the, in the channels. Um, uh, in this introductory session, I will uh, uh, introduce a little bit of the research topics that, are, uh, that, that have motivated you know, this, this work that I'm presenting today and hopefully the work that you and I together in the community can carry on. Uh, we'll also be um, looking at, uh, you know, if you remember, some of you may have responded to a Google form survey a few months ago, uh, which basically precipitated this particular workshop. I'll be looking at some of the responses in the survey, which I think will kind of capture uh, what the community expects from this type of work and this type of uh, uh, development. Okay. Uh, after uh, completing that particular um, discussion, uh, I'll basically whet your appetite a little bit by talking about a few uh, scientific case studies, which uh, for example, this particular uh, work, Python form uh, ha has enabled and, and you know, uh, lines of investigation that not just myself uh, and my co-instructors, my co but other people at, at the lab and beyond in other uh, institutions are following up using this type of technology. Uh, after this, my, uh, my co-instructor, uh, Bethany Lush, will take over with a, uh, with a, with a hands-on, well, with a, with a session about um, uh, sort of an introduc introduction to coupling technologies and, and uh, uh, basically introduce you within the Docker container to a very simple example that uh, encompasses the, the nature of a, a lot of different problems that we'll be looking at the fact that we want to couple a simulation code with a data science code. And that, that will also be approximately um, uh, half an hour, uh, uh, again, following uh, with a break. Uh, after that, uh, I will be taking over and, and going through the Docker container in setting up uh, an open form integration for Python. So how do you call data science libraries from Python? How do you, uh, from, from open form through Python functions and Python modules? And, and this is going to be the meat of, of, our, of our workshop today. I will be uh, switching between slides and the terminal uh, and, and programming with you, so to speak, uh, to get this set up. And, and like I said, uh, you know, we have plenty of time. So uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any moment if you have any question. Uh, and, uh, and after I finish, um, I hope to also have another session where we interact with each other uh, about uh, you know your questions about the future of this particular uh, type of work uh, any suggestions any feedback about the workshop or in general and, and and basically i'll be sticking around till the end of the workshop for for anybody to uh, to have any questions uh, or, or have any discussions with okay Okay, so uh, so this is uh, the agenda. I guess before I get started, I guess this is a good time to pause and you know ask uh, people if they have any questions, um, any um, uh, any issues with 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 uh, with the Slack, with uh, uh, anything else. Um, happy to uh, you know pause a moment over here and address any concerns before I get started. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes, uh, I can. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I have a question. Do we access to the recordings uh, and do you record this session? The session is being recorded and it will be provided to all the participants after, after we finish. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, and all the slides, that's a good point. All the slides will also be made available. 
uh, so what I'm what my idea is that every time we take a break uh, at the end of, for example, my first uh, uh, session before Bethany takes over, I have the PDF of these slides ready to go. I'll just paste it in the Slack channel and pin it so that uh, people can immediately uh, go back and look at it. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, so, uh, you know, when I'm presenting in Zoom, I, I sh I've shared my screen, so it's a little difficult for me to check the Slack chat, uh, check the Zoom chat. So again, I encourage you to, to use the Slack chat instead of Zoom. Okay, so uh, I guess we are looking healthy, so I will keep going. Uh, Okay, so so let's uh, start off with uh, you know a quick discussion about you know why we are doing this, right? Why are we why are we uh, hosting this workshop to start with? But even more importantly, what is uh, you know this discord that we have developed, and and we are hoping to disseminate among the open source community? What what is it really aimed at? Why are we interested in it, right? So one of the biggest motivations uh, from a, a hardware perspective is, is that if you look at a lot of the new large supercomputers that are, uh, that are being commissioned, uh, not just here in, uh, in the US, but around the world, you'll notice that a lot of them are essentially um, uh, heterogeneous in nature, right? So over here, heterogeneous uh, hardware refers to hardware which is not purely a CPU type machine, which uh, traditionally is the type of um, uh, architecture that you would find in any, any large uh, supercomputing resource. Instead, nowadays you will have uh, nodes on these machines, which, uh, which have, in addition to CPUs, they also have GPUs, uh, such as the NVIDIA GPUs, uh, here in this slide, I have, a, uh, I have a picture of Aurora, which is going to be uh, a large exascale machine that will come online here at Argonne shortly. And as you can see, it's going to have a very unique type of uh, hardware uh, node, uh, for example, where you will have two CPUs on one node, uh, coupled with six GPUs. So uh, what does that mean in the sense of, of, of someone who is doing computation physics or machine learning or data science? is that your workloads will have to be adequately mapped to this hardware. So if you are doing CFD, which is highly likely given that you have come to an open form uh, based workshop, you would know that open form, at least the, the code that is uh, released by openform.org uh, is a CPU only code. So it's a code that cannot at this moment without you actually investing a significant amount of time into it, leverage any GPUs. Uh, uh, you would also be familiar that a lot of machine learning workloads, which are, such as deep learning, anything that requires uh, neural networks, uh, is particularly well suited to using GPUs. And you would also be aware that there's a lot of research out there that tries to use machine learning with computational physics, such as fluid dynamics. And uh, in such cases, it would be beneficial to have your simulation run on a CPU because your code is, is adapted to run on the CPU from legacy and your machine learning to, to run on the GPU and you to communicate between them, right? So, so, so and that is the, this, this sort of flowchart that you have over here where you've traditionally had only CPU type methods. Uh, uh, nowadays, it's very common to have a CPU plus GPU type of architecture, but in the future, you are looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, a variety of uh, architectures that may be uh, living on a particular type of uh, machine. So how do we actually construct a development ecosystem to, to leverage these types of advances, right? So uh, and that, is the, that is the motivation of, of this particular code that we are developing, right? Now, in addition to hardware motivations, there may also be uh, certain uh, well, like scientific motivations to, to actually uh, develop these types of codes which couple simulations and, and data science. Uh, for example, uh, you have uh, uh, one particular type of science question you may have is how to choose your simulations, something related to optimal experimental design. Uh, for example, let's say that you are running a campaign of numerical simulations where you wish to 
um, wish to, uh, for example, uh, in, in, for example, in computational fluid dynamics, you want to explore a set of geometries, right? Or you want to explore a set of physical conditions. How do you choose this set so that the data that you're generating optimally covers or optimally covers a quantity of interest, right? In such a case, you may want to have an outer loop uh, control of your uh, numerical simulation that samples different initial conditions, different boundary conditions, different uh, Reynolds numbers, potentially, if you're thinking about turbulence. Uh, and, and, uh, and in such cases, you may wish to have a coupling between uh, like a simulation and a, and a data science type of um, uh, paradigm. Uh, another, uh, uh, you know, research question that I am, uh, you know, extremely interested in, and I will be talking about a lot today is surrogate modeling. So let's say that, you know, you have an expensive numerical simulation and you, uh, using whatever logic, you've decided to bypass a portion of this simulation using a, uh, a data-driven model, uh, which is, again, something that I do on a daily basis for, for my work. Uh, if you're using a machine learning based surrogate model, then it may be uh, very useful to actually uh, have this type of framework that we are offering, where the computational physics occurs on a legacy code, such as open form or, or what have you, and the, uh, and the data driven uh, inference or the machine learning uh, training and uh, machine learning uh, query after training, uh, testing is, is done using Python. So it's useful to connect these two types of, uh, types of um, uh, you know, coding uh, uh, sort of paradigms. And what we want to do is connect them seamlessly so that uh, you don't have any, uh, any limitations with uh, input output bottlenecks. So to expand on this a little, if you went back a few years, let's say half a decade, and you looked at most of the, of the, of the machine learning studies in CFD, you would see that a lot of them relied on actually dumping data to, uh, to the disk uh, and then reading that in with a se separate code, which did the training or did, uh, did the learning and then uh, embedding that learning back into the original code again through disk by, by, by uh, querying something from the ne neural network and then uh, writing that out to disk. So uh, what we want to do is avoid any sort of uh, disk input output uh, while we are doing our simulation and data science coupling. Okay. So let's give you a few scientific examples over here, right? Just to, just to uh, you know, uh, make, get you curious. Uh, over here, this is a uh, this is a schematic from a paper that uh, uh, you know some of my co-instructors and I actually published together recently, where we used uh, uh, essentially the same framework that I'm showing you to uh, to predict um, a turbulent eddy viscosity. So for those in the audience who are um, you know uh, who are not very familiar with uh, with turbulence modeling in in CFD. Um, there are certain quantities uh, which uh, which uh, which are which are uh, uh, generally modeled using partial differential equations that help you simulate complex um, high energy flows such as such as the one that I'm showing on the left. So over here you have uh, flow going from left to right, right over this backward facing step, which causes a separation region over here. We want to simulate this flow, obviously. Uh, uh, and and uh, our, our sort of question is that for varying inlet velocity speeds and varying step heights, we want to build a, a surrogate model for the full computation of the flow. So the full computation of the flow is expensive. So we want to do it using a data-driven model. So what we did in this particular work was we generated some training data for different step heights and different inlet velocities and, and trained a surrogate model to predict the turbulent eddy viscosity, which is one, uh, one of the uh, state variables. So if you're solving a coupled system of equations, one of those equations was the new T that you see on the left-hand side. And by virtue of actually predicting this with a data-driven technique rather than the equation, uh, we were able to get a dramatic acceleration. So you can see these, um, uh, these uh, the green, the uh, orange, and the blue lines are the convergence curves for the velocity fields. Um, in essence, they 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 check the, the 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 progress to solution for your computation, a steady state computation, and they were accelerated dramatically, as you can see, 
uh, in comparison to the regular computation because the machine learning actually uh, was able to uh, take a big uh, chunk of compute uh, and then just break it directly. So this is the type of things uh, that, that our framework enables. This is the type of thing that interests me. We want to be able to, um, uh, to, to accelerate simulations or make simulations more accurate using data. And we also have a, uh, a, a framework to, to make this uh, possible for. Okay, another example, which is a follow-up of that same study is, is shown in this uh, uh, reference over here. So while in the previous case, we were predicting a quantity in the steady state sense. So we wanted to, wanted to have a statistically steady prediction for a particular physical process. Uh, over here, we were making the same prediction, but doing it for a transient type of process. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a prediction for uh, the flow of exit velocity through this nozzle uh, in this axis of symmetric geometry using CFD. And on the right is something that you uh, get using what we call ML CFD, but the idea is similar. We have a, a particular equation of the state that is costly, which is uh, uh, which again, it classically has its own PD, but we don't solve the PD anymore. We just use a neural network instead. And as you can see, it retains the accuracy quite nicely, but uh, in general, as the problem size increases, you see greater and greater gains uh, uh, for the, uh, for, by, by actually not having to solve that extra uh, set of equations. So, uh, so as your size grows, you you will see that you will get even greater and greater benefits from using a neural network instead of another uh, partial differential equation for the area viscosity. So, so this is another example that that should hopefully motivate you. Okay, so uh, I told you that uh, you, know, you know surrogate modeling is important to us, but another thing that that we are quite interested in is also uh, is also to make post processing easier. So. If, you can, if you've ever run a numerical simulation, as I'm sure you have in the past, you may be aware of the fact that um, uh, it's not easy to write data to disk. If you if you've run a very, very fine simulation, you generally have to be very judicious in selecting which snapshots of your simulation in time to save because you can't save everything, right? Otherwise it would blow your storage. So one of the things that we are very interested in is to actually do in situ compression or in situ analysis of our data so that we don't need to store all the information uh, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and thereby lose out on potentially some physical insight because we are not able to probe our data. So for example, training online, if you want to do data science using your, uh, using your, uh, your simulation data as one example of, of uh, analysis that can be possible through like a tight coupling between data science and simulations. Um, uh, if you also want to do some sort of in-situ coherent structure uh, uh, extraction or in-situ you know, uh, computation, uh, for this data without hopefully having to store it to disk, uh, store it to disk then our framework is also also enables that. So and and of course, since you do have access to all this data that is available in memory without having to save it to disk, you can also uh, uh, give some feedback using either a data science approach or or even otherwise, as you can see uh, in in today's work. To, to actually uh, uh, control your simulation or, or uh, basically enhance um, the scientific insight of your, of your simulations, okay? So to give you an example over here, let's say that you uh, want to do a modal analysis. So this is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that should be a part of every engineer's toolkit. Uh, the idea is to, if you have a time varying uh, process, you can collect snapshots from that time varying process and and essentially do a singular value decomposition of this process to, uh, to identify some coherent structures. So for example, I go back to the same problem that I was talking about where you have flow going from left to right. And as you can see, it's a two dimensional problem, but you can see that for uh, different instances in time, there are the, the velocity in the X and the Y direction are, uh, are different because it's a time varying process. And by actually analyzing these snapshots of U and V uh, in situ without storing it to disk, you are able to extract coherent structures. So for example, these uh, uh, contours that you see over here correspond to uh, what structures in our flow field actually have a lot of energy. So you can uh, actually see that the nature of how energy is, is uh, 
uh, is actually contained in in the in the in the direction of the x velocity in in the x direction of the velocity and the y direction of the velocity are quite different so and they're all concentrated in the uh, downstream area of, of of the near this uh, near the separation so so this is something that is um, that uh, that is enabled by again a tight coupling between your data science and simulation which otherwise you would have to first extract this data to disk store it uh, maybe get rid of some of the data which is obviously never good and then uh, and then do the analysis post hoc feed it back into your visualizer so there's a lot of things that we can bypass using uh, using the method over here okay finally just to mention over here this is not something we'll be looking at today but uh, uh, another thing that that we can do with uh, this type of data science and machine and, and, and computational uh, framework coupling is actually controlling simulations so let's say that um, you have a control problem you are, or you have an optimization problem uh, which which, uh, which uh, requires you to again sample a space of parameters or geometries or, or flow conditions uh, you can uh, you can um, uh, have the machine learning on the in the outer loop sense do this uh, quite efficiently uh, again uh, you know for a variety of uh, uh, problems uh, and that is also something that that we are interested in okay so i will ignore that and and then finally come to something that probably uh, you know you have been expecting me to say uh, uh, i have mentioned this in the bottom over here uh, uh, our goal, uh, specifically, uh, you know, the you know the authors of this code and 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 the, the organizers of this workshop, is to, is to make OpenFORM um, the flagship framework for data science in in CFD. So OpenFORM is also the is is already the flagship open source code for CFD, right? Uh, there is a reason there's so much interest in in OpenFORM and in this workshop. There is a very vibrant developer community. There is a, you know, if I'm sure a lot of you have already been to cfdonline.com where there is always help to be had for people who are struggling with open form. And yes, people do struggle with it. I've struggled with it as well. Uh, but uh, there is a tremendous opportunity essentially for, um, uh, for, for making, uh, you know, open form uh, the, tool, the tool for doing data science uh, for uh, fluid dynamics applications. Uh, you might may have been you, you must have been noticing a lot of literature out there recently where machine learning is used for a variety of fluids problems. And uh, one of the things that that irks us over here is the fact that uh, not all the code is is easily uh, is is rep is available. Firstly, and and secondly, the, if the codes are not available, they are usually not reproducible, and this kind of feeds into the reproduci reproducibility crisis of. Uh, of of this line of research, uh, and we want to tackle that. And and you know, if you go back to the one of the most important principles of um, uh, of uh, essentially research today, which is the fact that your research must be fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, then then the framework that we are developing perfectly fits uh, this particular notion. Uh, what I want for the research that I'm doing, and hopefully the research that other people would be doing with this type of code, is to is to make their work available to to prove that you know the work they have done is is not, uh, for example, by cherry picking uh, certain use cases to let the community validate. In addition to uh, peer review, uh, their uh, their findings, and uh, and that is what I I envision this this uh, code to be. Uh, as you as you will be uh, as you will know, if you go into the GitHub repository, I have several examples over there from the uh, from the first paper that we have put out with this particular framework, uh, and that is meant to essentially uh, uh, reinforce this notion of reproducibility of data science uh, research in in uh, in CFD. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I, I I quickly wanted to. Uh, uh, Go over some of the some of the findings of the survey that I had put out uh, on LinkedIn a, a few weeks ago, which I got some very interesting replies from. Um, so, for example, I had uh, I had done a I had done a little bit of a quiz about how many people are experienced with OpenFORM and experienced with Python, uh, just to give you uh, some uh, idea of the type of of, of co attendee you have today. So. Uh, you will see that a lot of you may not be familiar with uh, with with OpenFORM, 
which is completely fine. Uh, I was a novice at some point as well. I still am uh, in some sense. Uh, it's an unfathomably complex code and there are many uh, parts of it which I've never ever experienced. Uh, a small subset of, of the responses said that they are developers of OpenFOAM to you if you are one of them. Thank you very much, firstly, for, for, for being here. I mean, your presence is highly appreciated. Please help out your fellow co-attendee in case they have any trouble with open form, you know, in the rest of the workshop. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and, and, and then there was a healthy percentage of users. I also encourage you to, uh, to help out any novices or, or each other as much as possible. We want to really make this a community thing. Uh, I also asked about uh, uh, experience with Python, and you can see that over here, there were many more users and developers than there were novices. Python is, after all, one of the most popular, if not the most popular programming uh, language out there at the moment. Uh, uh, I don't envision many issues with, with, uh, with uh, you know, writing Python today, but again, uh, it, we have only five instructors over here, but you know, 100 plus participants. So help out your instructors by, um, by really contributing to any sort of discussion of a question and so on. Um, so uh, thanks again for, for, uh, for joining us. Okay, and then some of the comments that I, that I found uh, uh, about, um, uh, you know, this, this, in this particular survey, which kind of reflect what the community also wants from this line of work is uh, is is uh, are, are these which I've uh, listed over here. So for example, uh, you know the first comment says, I would like to explore the use of machine learning and deep learning for CFD. Um, and then I agree, you know we will have some examples today where we will be looking at uh, deploying a deep learning autoencoder, for example, in a CFD simulation. Um, and and uh, so this is something that you know we are extremely interested in and continuing to work on. Uh, another uh, comment was that this is a great idea for algorithm prototyping, uh, especially for for people who do not have experience with open form programming. This is very important, right? So writing C plus plus code uh, is is not easy, right? Uh, it makes me sweat for sure. I'm sure there are other people in the audience who have suffered with with writing and debugging C and C plus plus code. Uh, the advantage of Python is that it's easy to write and it's very easy to, to, uh, to for example, give to someone uh, who uh, may not have past experience with C++, but may be a very good mathematician, a very good algorithm developer. So you can build quick prototypes of functions uh, for test in real world scenarios because OpenFORM is a very, you know, it's a practical code. It can run, you know, large cases. Uh, uh, without uh, without much problems, so we want to also leverage uh, that. Uh, uh, so again, I found this as a, a pretty funny comment. They said that uh, they have been someone has been using OpenFOAM and Python together for almost two years, uh, but they say more in a way, a way where Python is a chef de orchestra and OpenFOAM is the orchestra, which which basically means Python is used to, uh, uh, in some sense, control OpenFOAM. Right. So there is a a uh, framework out there called PyFOAM, which is uh, which is used to uh, manipulate OpenFOAM case case direct directories. So, if for people who are not familiar, the way you run OpenFOAM is you write you modify some text files, which OpenFOAM reads from the command line, and then and then runs a simulation. So, Py Python can obviously do text manipulation and and then you know directory creation. So, PyFOAM does that. We are not talking about PyFOAM. We are talking about Python form, which is a tight coupling of Python functions within OpenFOAM, right? So we're not doing things like modifying case directories. We could, but, but that is not our purpose. Our purpose is to call complex Python functions specifically, for example, related to machine learning or CFD from OpenFOAM, right? Uh, and of course, a lot of people are here just because they're curious. So there are many people who are not uh, data scientists. There are many people who are not CFD developers. They are just here to see, you know, uh, this is an interesting direction. And you know I'm happy for them to be here as well. Okay, so so with that, let me just quickly finish uh, with a uh, with with my sort of my vision statement before we have a short break and and have Bethany take over. Um, uh, I'm really really interested in setting up a Python form community. Uh, I believe that you know uh, the sum of you know open form developers and users is greater than its parts. Uh, if we can interact via um, uh, via Slack, uh, 
in in you know after the uh, the the completion of the workshop to uh, to discuss uh, potential research projects collaborations that would be i would be very happy personally if that that can happen uh, of course we are we are very interested in continuing this this uh, this workshop uh, we've got a fantastic response as you can see for the first one but we want to uh, keep this going uh, uh, hopefully again next year uh, uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in, and I'll have to talk to the folks here at Argon about it, is to uh, is to move to a hybrid type of uh, scenario where um, uh, where perhaps people who actually have used Python from who are not a part of our research group uh, are invited to present their test cases, right? And in some way, we want to showcase that there is a community effort in in, in the in towards the use and contribution to this code. So we would be extremely happy to to have a you know like a a, a hands-on session, a discussion session like we are doing today. But in addition, invite people to talk about their experiences with this code, what research problems they have solved, and potentially even uh, you know uh, invite them uh, on site. But again, this is uh, with, with the pandemic and everything, it's difficult to say where that will go. But that is definitely uh, something that I'm uh, interested in. And finally, like I said, all our code is available on on GitHub and and with through this Docker container that you have. Uh, please uh, feel free to uh, make pull requests on our GitHub repository. Please feel free to uh, make suggestions, open issues. Really want you to uh, to to you know. Uh, to contribute towards uh, our efforts and, and help us improve the code and, and potentially join us in, a, in any uh, research collaboration. Okay, so again, another request, uh, please help out your fellow attendees via Slack. Uh, the organizers will have their hands full. And uh, if you have uh, fixed, solved a problem, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to let someone else who is struggling with it. Okay, so with that, I will stop my share and keep my video running uh, for a while. Uh, uh, while Bethany gets set up, I, I think we are on time. Uh, at this moment, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to, to, to let me know. I see, I see there's some stuff happening on Slack, so I will, I will take a quick look at it. So it is 8.37 now. Uh, Bethany, do you think we can, um, uh, we can uh, wait till 8.45 maybe, till you start, or do you, do you, do you think we can do with a longer break? Yeah, I think we could do a longer break. Um, and in the meantime, if you haven't installed Docker and downloaded the container, that would be good to do. Okay, great. So yeah, install Docker uh, uh, um, and uh, and download the container and see if you can get that running. Uh, then shall we target uh, eight fifty for for our start? Ten minutes before nine. Bethany? Yep, sounds good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be online over here, so feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask any questions. Uh, I will also be monitoring the Slack, but at 8.50, Bethany will come in and, and, and start uh, 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 her portion of the talk. Okay. And now we're ready to uh, work with some code. And before we talk about coupling OpenFoam with Python, we'll start with just a more basic example that's C++ in Python, so it's a little more strict then. And if you're having any um, technical issues, um, ideally post them in Slack instead of Zoom um, so that the answers are still there after the Zoom call ends. And we've got a few people in Slack to help answer questions. Um, it's hard for me to see, to monitor the chat while I'm sharing my slides. Okay. So for this tutorial, we're using Docker, um, which is a platform for containers. And this is um, a nice way to easily have all of us in the same environment instead of trying to set up the OpenFOAM and Python in everyone's different computers. Um, and this is a nice way to get started before you move to say your HPC systems or your local clusters. And so these instructions are in the Slack. Um, if you haven't um, done this yet, I would encourage you to do so. And so first of all, you, you install Docker. 
and then you need to have Docker running, and then you can pull uh, the Python foam container. And then that next line, that next command looks like through lines here, but it, it should be all one command. Um, and the next line uh, should enable being able to have plots pop up. And then this Docker start actually starts the container. We've already, you've downloaded it, now you're starting it. And then this line would have, give you a bash command line in the container. And these instructions are in Slack, but they're also on the, the GitHub repo for Python phone. And for some context, um, there are different ways to couple AI and simulations. And this figure is adapted from Venkat Vishwanath in this paper, a terminology for institute visualization and analysis. Um, sorry, I'm just not advancing. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, loosely coupling would be that you have um, could, could be that you have AI and simulation on the same resource with different processes so they're sharing space a tight coupling could be that they're. Um, one process on the same resource and you're switching in time so that's what we're going to do today, we have the simulation calling Python. Um, I have AI in this diagram, but of course it doesn't have to be AI, it could be some kind of analysis or just Python in general. Um, and so it says time shared because you have to switch between them. So you, you run the simulation, you do Python, you go back to the simulation and so forth. And then there could also be an even more loosely coupled way where you have them on different resources. For example, different GPUs, or even um, moving data between like, say a supercomputer and an edge device or something like that. So this is just some context that today we're talking, uh, everything with Python foam is tightly coupled. And in this example, we're going to have C++ start and we're going to run a little simulation and we want to call Python from the simulation. And Python has a C API, which enables us to embed Python in C or C++. And that way we can load up Python modules and Python functions and call them from C++. So um, we start C++, we uh, iterate forward in the simulation, we're calling Python, and we're going back to the simulation. And we're using the NumPy C API to transfer data. So that's an overview before we go into the code. And for this um, basic example, we're going to solve a PDE in C++, Burger's equation. And we're going to build a surrogate model for it using machine learning in Python, specifically TensorFlow. Um, the dimensionality, we're doing dimensionality reduction first using POD, or if you're not familiar with that, it's basically PCA. And then predict forward in time in that low dimensional space with a neural network that has LSTM layers. And so these details aren't important for the tutorial, but if you're interested in the details, you can check out um, this paper that we wrote where we um, do this kind of surrogate model uh, published in physics of fluids and the code is on github you could uh, go to this link or the link is in the paper so i'm not going to dive into the machine learning and just some context for this example and this is what the burgers equation data looks like it's evolving forward in time and approaching a shock and when we do pod or pca these are the first three modes that you get so we're, pre we're um, doing this dimensionality reduction and then the predicting forward in time is in terms of the coefficients of these modes. 
And so before we open up the code, here's a diagram of what's happening. In C++, uh, we allocate a 1D array U, and that is the uh, spatial discretization in 1D. Um, and we uh, loop over time, solving the PDE reverse equation one step forward, updating U. And we have a Python function to collect the data. So we're passing a pointer to the updated U. And over in Python, we have a global array and it's copying U into a new row. So over in Python, we're keeping track of U as it evolves. And then after we're done solving Berger's equation, then we do this analyze data, um, which calls this Python function. Uh, it plots, it does a PCA or POD on that array, which gets you uh, V. Uh, we train a neural network on the PCA coefficients, then return the first three rows of V back to C++, and C++ can print two of those rows. And this is just to, to demonstrate how to couple C++ and Python. And so now we're going to dive into the code. So assuming that you got to here in those instructions, you've, um, you have a command line in your container, then we're going to go into the home directory, the simple compiling example. If you wanted to, you could rebuild um, the code at this point, or you can use the existing um, build. You can move into the build folder and run app. Now I'm going to um, pause my sharing so that I can show you um, my terminal. Okay, um, now I'm sharing my desktop. You see my terminal on top of Visual Studio? Yes, Bethany, it's visible. Cool. Okay, so I know I encourage you to already have um, Docker installed. For me, I can see that Docker is running because I have this little icon up here. Um, I'm pulling the container. We can run. Starting the container. And, um, can go into a bash um, command line. And uh, in order to easily go back and forth between the code and the terminal, I'm actually going to open it in Visual Studio Code. So Romit showed me there's this cool Docker extension. Um, and so I can see my container here in, in the files. So we want to go to home, simple compiling example. And now I'm opening the C++ code. And um, okay. And I can even attach the shell 
so that we see the terminal right here um, next to the code. All right, so here's the main C++ code. And um, we're, we have this line to um, initialize NumPy. Here we have some code so we can track the resource utilization. Here we initialize Python. And then this Py runs simple string we pass a string that is the command that we want to run in Python. So here we're importing the sys library we're adding um, to our Python path. And um, we can print initializing NumPy library. And here we're calling that function up here, um, init NumPy. And I know this is a weird looking function, but this is a way to initialize the NumPy library with the C API. Okay, so now we want to load a Python module and we pass uh, the string that is the name of the Python module. And um, so now we've got the name or we, um, and we, we import it using this py import. And so now we've loaded a Python module. Um, and so if you're running this with the um, let's see, I can do that again. Uh, we see um, these print statements, uh, it's moving quite fast. <laughs> Um, but if you're, if you scroll up, we can see that we're moving back and forth between C++ and Python. Um, okay. So now we want particular functions from the Python module. And so we have to tell C++ the names of those functions that we want. We want a function called collection func that's in that module, Python module. And we want this analyses func. And so now C++ um, has objects for those particular Python functions. And uh, here we're gonna initialize that U array for the solving the PDE. And um, NX is the number of spatial points. And then we add two extra ones for the boundary conditions. Um, and we have this function to initialize U. So if we scroll down here, we're picking an initial condition and setting the periodic boundary conditions. And then we need um, this temp array in order to step forward in time. And we also initialize it. Um, and we're going to time our loop. We're going to step forward in time and each time evolve Berger's equation forward. So we can check out what's happening to update the solution. And so um, here we're just stepping forward. We have u being dependent on the previous time step. And um, of course, later we're going to change this out to be open foam. And then here's the part where we're going to just for demonstration pur purposes, um, pass the data over to Python. And um, so here, uh, p collection func was that Python function. And um, we have a function collect data. Now, um, when we call the Python function, here was that object for the Python function and we had to pass it some args. Um, and so in order to do that, we make this special pi tuple and we say it's gonna have one thing in it. And we say um, that, that here we set 
the first thing in the tuple to be the array 1D. And we're creating this array from the data U. So we have to tell it um, the dimension we're making and that it should be NumPy float 64. So these are some uh, details of how we're passing our array U, making it a NumPy array and um, passing it as an argument to um, the Python function. Then we do some dereferencing um, and, and deallocate this NumPy array, uh, that, this array that we used for the pass. Um, now we can also go over to the Python code. So we're in this, uh, again, we're in home, simple coding example. And in the build folder, we have the Python module.py. That's uh, that one that we told C++ that we're interested in. And over here, we have this global array that's going to hold all those um, time steps forward. And we have that collection func. And we're passing it that 1D array, which is the next solution. And we're just adding it to the next row. And we have this global counter to move through the array. Um, and then we also told C++ that we were interested in this function analysis func. And here we're going to do some plotting. We're plotting um, just the solution evolving forward, saving it. This is a matplotlib and we're saving it to a PNG. And here's where we do um, what you might be it's an SVD, you might be familiar with it as POD or PCA um, to the full solution, the uh, Berger's equation. And we're going to plot the first three modes. And that's that plot that I showed you on the slides. And saving that to PNG. And so you can see here, since I've run the code, these um, files are starting to show up here. For example, uh, SVD eigenvectors, PNG. Um, and so one thing I can do is that since I'm in Visual Studio Code, I can do this download button to um, download from the Docker container to be on my laptop. Um, and you can also do the docker cp command. Um, does someone else want to put that in Slack because I don't have it memorized? Um, if you want to get it um, over onto your computer and outside of the container to look at. Now here we have um, those eigenvectors. We're interested in the first few. Um, or and we're gonna get the uh, PCA coefficients. And we're gonna say the training data is the beginning of this data and the test data is the later part. And we have this other Python module, ML module, and we're importing the neural network from there. Uh, we train the model and then we apply it to the test data. Now, I'm not gonna go into the machine learning model. We, we could if we end up having spare time, but that's not the point of this tutorial. And um, for demonstration purposes, we're going to return the initial modes back to C++. So if we go back over to the C++ code, app.cpp, um, and we go back up here. Recall we are looping forward to in time, solving Berger's equation. Um, we're tracking how long this took. And then we call that analyze data, um, which I just showed you. 
but we have this wrapper C++ function. So we can scroll down here and it looks similar to the collect data C++ function in that we need to have um, these initial steps in order to actually call this function in Python. So this is that object that knows the function in Python and we need to pass it some arguments. And so we make a tuple, pytuple new one, and we set that the first item is this array 1D, um, which just like before is uh, needs to be in the right format for NumPy and we're copying, um, we're pointing to you. And we do some dereferencing and deallocate. Now, um, that Python function returned the initial eigenvectors. And so now we're interested in printing them just to um, demonstrate that we really did pass the data back to C++. And so this would be one way to do it. We're using this helper function, pyarray uh, get pointer two um, to p value. And we're saying we want row zero and then we're iterating over the columns. And we're printing the first mode, the first uh, 10 entries. And then um, it can do the same for the next mode. So we just say we move on to row one. And then uh, dereference. So if we check out in our terminal, um, this is showing that we're um, stepping forward in time, solving Berger's equation, and we're successfully passing the data over to Python. Um, and then we uh, start TensorFlow to do the machine learning. Sorry, first there is the SVD. Then we, uh, we have a bunch of warnings about TensorFlow. Um, and here we're printing as we uh, go along with the training. Uh, the validation loss is improving. Um, and then we do inference, and uh, meaning that we apply it to the test data. And then now we're back in C++ and uh, printing the first mode. Uh, and if you look at these prediction um, images, uh, you'll see that we're doing a terrible job. This is just a little tutorial um, in reality in order to train well we need uh, more training data and you'll notice this was just one initial condition of Berger's equation and the training data was the initial part um, as we saw forward in time and the test data was the later part as we approach a shock and so the test data is like new physics that hasn't been seen in the initial part. So this is really not sufficient for machine learning um, in case you're wondering why these predictions look so bad. Um, but this that's not the point here. We didn't wanna have an awesome machine learning model. Um, we just wanted to demonstrate coupling C++ and Python. And um, like I mentioned, if you wanna see uh, a more complete way to do this kind of surrogate model, we have a paper on that. Now I can pause for questions and I'm checking Slack to see how it's going. Yeah, but then it seems like a lot of people are having, uh, well, not a lot, like three by my count are having issues with um, uh, actually running the simple example in the Docker mm -hmm. container for a Mac machine. So you're running this on a Mac, right? Yes. Uh, do, what OS are you using on the Mac? I'm sorry, I'm not a Mac person at all, uh, folks. I'm, I'm old school Linux. So you're using I have Monterey. Monterey. Okay, and, um, and, and, in, and in your case, it just worked out of the box, right? 
Mm -hmm. And even without Visual Studio, I also just did it in the terminal. Okay, um, so... What was the kind of error? Yeah, but it's for the new Mac uh, book because they have new uh, processors. Uh... And Docker container. I think it may be related to the Apple, Apple chip. Yeah. Okay, so you think it's a hardware issue? Yeah, it's for sure. Yeah. Okay, mm. so that. Uh, okay, so at least one thing I can do on my end is uh, is uh, uh, potentially work with someone who has one of those machines over here and and like release another Docker container. Which, uh, but but obviously I can't do it right away. So I'm really sorry, folks, for that. Uh, sort of uh, skipped my uh, my my tests. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to work with uh, with you uh, on the, on the Slack to see if we can come up with any alternative. Uh, but but for now, I guess uh, uh, you can try to to audit it <laughs> and uh, and and you know stay in touch. Uh, you know after the workshop, so we can uh, we can potentially uh, have you set up as well on the Docker. And does this fail? Um... right away or is it possible that the open foam example will work? I, I think it's an issue with TensorFlow. Yeah. Hmm. At least open foam works for me, but I even try to solve this that, you know, Python form has. Mm -hmm. So I think the 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 hands-on that I have for Python form that will not use TensorFlow. So in that case, I think we should be fine. So to, to, you know, for the members of the audience who are having trouble with this example, this example is special because it uses TensorFlow, right? And TensorFlow may have some optimization that's incompatible, some instructions that are incompatible with, with this new chip. Mm. Uh, uh, what I would encourage you to do is open a Python uh, shell from the command line and import NumPy and see if NumPy loads appropriately because the example I'll be working through will only need NumPy, okay? And then, uh, so um, uh, so if, if that works, then, uh, you know, you should be able to follow along for, for at least my portion. Uh, and then we can figure out what, what, what can be done with TensorFlow later. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll, I'll look for my instructions on the general channel. Do we have any other questions? I see someone asking how to open the generated PNG files. So one option is to use the Docker CP commands that Remit has a little further up in the Slack channel. Um, so for example, if you want to do, um, well, I'll read it in case someone's watching this recording and not, doesn't have the Slack channel. Um, or actually, I can copy it over here. OK, so if you want to copy from your container to your local path, then you can do Docker CP and then uh, your container ID, which in my case was um, Python foam contain uh, Python foam. Uh, I forget if it's called Python foam container um, and the path to the file. So we have um, under home, simple coding, coupling example, uh, build, and then the images, and then your local path. But I guess we shouldn't be doing this in the Docker container. You should be doing it back on your terminal. Um, and then um, Robert mentioned in Slack that you can also reverse this if you want to copy files into your Docker container. Um, so you can do Docker CP, the path on your computer, and then um, your container ID, and then the path to where you want it to go. Um, Thanks, Bethany. So yeah, I called it, we, we, we called it Python from underscore container. So this would be um when you're not inside a container right Roman like you just have a terminal 
the Docker CP? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, on a regular uh, container, not from within the uh, yeah. within the Docker shell. Yes. So when you're in the Docker shell, it's not going to understand a Docker command. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, so I think Bethany, what do you say? We we give give the folks some time to digest this material. I mean, I put the slides on the Slack channel, uh, and uh, I have. Um, also, um, uh, I, I'm also interacting with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, perhaps we, we, we meet at 9.45 so that they can go through this example, see if they have any questions, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then we can pick up from there. Does that sound good? Yep. So, uh, Andrew, you have a question? Feel free to unmute. Yes, please. Just, just uh, at a higher level, you had a slide on loose and tight coupling, and we started with a slide on heterogeneity. And I wonder if loose is in scope. Mm. So today, well, all of Python's well is set up to be a tight coupling. Um, if you have any questions about loose coupling, uh, maybe we can discuss in Slack, or do you have any comments from it? Yes. Yeah, so we don't have anything uh, at this moment um, uh, to, to, to demonstrate loose coupling, uh, but we are working on some some ideas and and, and some implementations that we have not released yet. Uh, uh, essentially, you could think of um, building some uh, you know uh, some some form of uh, asynchronous execution into your into your code, which which calls Python. Um, uh, you know, uh, and and then releases uh, and releases a process in Python to actually continue to compute while you go back to your CPU. But we don't have that today. Uh, so, uh, but but let's stay in touch uh, if you want to learn more details. Okay, I mean, uh, you have my contact as well. I have a prototype of such a thing, and I'm so I'm interested in that subject matter. Thank you. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, look forward to cool. chatting with you. Uh, in essence, what we'll be doing from now on through to the end of the workshop is uh, is, is is deploying the same thing, but now uh, doing so in in open form, uh, and then you know uh, figuring out how to exchange um, uh, data between open form data structures and, and 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 you know Python and NumPy. Okay, so let's uh, keep going. So again, just a quick reminder, you know, by now probably, hopefully most of you have already figured out how to, how to use the Docker. Um, I would also encourage uh, uh, you to open up your own account on Docker Hub and, and push your own version of, of this Docker container and, and sort of freeze it, so to speak, so that you can mess around with it in the future and, 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 and um, uh, you know, uh, make changes. If you do have any changes that you that you've made, for example, to uh, to get this running on a different type of hardware or a different type of uh, you know uh, uh, device, uh, uh, let me know, and uh, I will uh, enable push access to you so that you can uh, commit your Docker container to this repository that, that's under my name uh, with a different tag. So a tag for that particular device. So in the future, when we have this workshop again, I will ask people to go to their respective tags if they have a certain type of uh, device. Okay, so here are just the instructions over here again. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, let me very quickly uh, also upload the latest slides to the general channel so, so that you can open it on the side because there'll be a little bit of hands-on work. So. Uh, Uh, you may want to copy paste some commands. And I will also pin these to the channel. Okay, so slides are on the on the general channel. Let's get back. Uh, you've been through this, this uh, Bethany went through this. Um, and, and, and in some sense, this is a repetition of, of the slide that Bethany showed, which is uh, you know how this uh, exchange of information between Python and, and OpenFOAM is, is is happening over here. What we uh, what we are doing is uh, is, is uh, essentially we are uh, going to start a particular application uh, or a particular solver for this particular hands-on. 
And then uh, within the solver, we will be calling uh, our Python C API once to, to sort of load Python or to start the Python interpreter. And then from that Python interpreter, we can load Python modules and Python functions and exchange data with using with the NumPy C API. So I, there'll be a little bit of a revision of what, what Bethany went, to, went through in the context of open form, right? And so uh, I guess now is a good time to essentially start, uh, you know, open up a terminal and go through the Python form hands-on example. So I will be going one slide, then terminal, then one slide, then terminal, and then back and forth. So again, at this moment, uh, if, if you know, feel free to stop me. I can pause at any moment. We have plenty of time uh, for for people to, uh, to to make sure that they are following along. Okay. So if you are uh, you know in the business of of doing development with Open Form, then you probably need to know that a lot of lot of code development is done by essentially copying over existing applications or solvers in Open Form and then uh, overwriting them with uh, with your modifications. So over here, what we will be doing is, is basically the same thing. We will be uh, compiling a new solver, but what we will do with this new solver is that we will embed the ability to call a Python interpreter in this new solver, right? So let me open up a terminal to show you how this is done. So if you go into, uh, if you go into uh, Python form, uh, which is in this particular path here, com Python form, you will see that there are uh, of course, examples that are available from the uh, uh, from the uh, GitHub repository, but I've added another folder called hands-on examples. This is the example we'll be going through today. Uh, and um, so apologies for this uh, Zoom bar. Okay, I'll get rid of that. Okay, so so over here, I you know I'm I'm going to behave like uh, one of those chefs in cooking shows, which is. Uh, you know, I'll have a fully prepared dish over here in case something goes wrong to, to go in and, and and see what's happening. But I will be also walking through the individual commands just like uh, just like you might be doing uh, at home. So um, so so yeah, essentially, uh, let's go into this folder and build a new solver and then put uh, embed Python into it, right? One step at a time. Okay, so so what do we need to compile a new solver? Well, the first thing we need to do is find a solver that is most similar to the solver we wish to use. And so in this particular case, let's go with simple form, which is a steady state solver, which is the workhorse again of a lot of steady state uh, studies performed in open form. And let's uh, uh, call this new simple form solver, I don't know, we'll call it new algo form. And, and then um, make the changes to this particular solver so that it's able to, uh, of course, be called something else. We don't want to call it simple form anymore. Uh, we want to call it something else. And also we want to link it to Python and NumPy so that you know, we can uh, get, go ahead with our, with our workshop. Okay, so let's do that. So I'm just gonna copy this first and actually if I can, no, I cannot, unfortunately, but I can try to do it over here. So I can uh, so I have just copied over the simple form solver over here. Let me rename this guy to new algo form, which is what we want to do. Again, at any moment, please unmute yourself and stop me if I'm going too fast or if something doesn't make sense. So all I've done so far is rename the, the folder I just downloaded. I, I just copied from open form's own solvers, okay? All right, so so let me go and uh, let me rename uh, rename. Okay, so I let me go inside new algo form and just uh, clean up some stuff. So the first thing I will do is I will re remove this SRF simple form because I don't. Oops, sorry, because I don't need this for the purpose of building my new solver. I also don't need a porous simple form. These are these are extra solvers that Open Form had in that tutorial, and so this is the basic structure of a, of a you know of a solver that you want to build. Uh, again, we don't want to overwrite simple form, so I'm going to change this guy to new algo form, just like the name of the uh, of the folder. So again, nothing special, right? And another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the the files of of uh, of the make, and again change this to new algo form, and the name of my solver is obviously not going to be simple form, it's going to be new algo. Okay, so that's just 
So what I've done so far is, is nothing that is new. Everybody who has a little bit of experience with open form has probably done this in the past. Okay, so, so this, is, um, this is what is happening. For a sanity check, I will now just compile what I have. So I'm basically going to compile simple form with a different name before adding anything to it, right? There should not be hopefully any errors over here. So for compiling, you can clean and w make. Over here, everything should compile without any trouble because I have literally just copied over simple form and not done anything to it, just changed its name. Let's see, unfortunately, since my Zoom is running, my compiling is going to be awfully slow. Sorry about that in advance, but you can see everything compiles. And if I run new algo form help, it's going to tell me that it's something from open form eight. And essentially the entire thing over here is just going to be the identical to simple form, right? So it's just that a new solver has been uh, added to added to the open form options. Okay. Okay, very good. So now we can go in and see how we uh, essentially uh, can include Python to, to, uh, to, the, to basically the, uh, make options over here so that when we, for example, uh, include the Python header files and the NumPy header files, we don't get errors because OpenFoam can't find it, right? So what we want to do over here is essentially add uh, certain uh, uh, paths uh, to, to, uh, to the header files for Python and NumPy and, and paths to the, the, to the Python library that, that we have to link during runtime. Okay, so in order to do that, let me not make a change now. Uh, let me go back to my slides and show you what this looks like. So essentially what we want to do is have a path to, well, in this case, I note a virtual environment over here because I copy pasted something from a, from a previous presentation. But essentially in this Docker container, this path goes to where Python is installed and to where NumPy is installed and, and so on. And so in order to set this up, uh, we need to know where the path is in our particular Docker container. And so uh, uh, we have done something quite convenient over here, which I will just show you very quickly. If I open another, uh, if I open another Docker shell, Okay, so if I am to go to home and cat prep and okay. So if you go into the home directory of this Docker container, you will see that uh, the paths to the different uh, uh, basically installations, the header files are already exported as environment variables and sourced the moment uh, you are in, uh, 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 you are within the shell. So what you can do is, is, is essentially just add these environment variables to your, um, to your options directly and, uh, and not have to worry uh, about uh, changing this in case uh, you, know, you, you want to change wholesale for multiple solvers. You can just change the source file over here and it automatically will detect everything. So what do we do? We just add our Python include path over here. And similarly, we add our NumPy. Okay, so this takes care of the, uh, the header files. We also have to take care of our, uh, sorry, the syntax error here. We also have to take care of our Library location, which uh, over here is is uh, given by the uh, Python lib path. So I'm just gonna copy this guy. And of course, at the end, I need to add L Python three. Actually, I don't even need to add this because I have the name of my library over here. So Python lib name, because uh, depending on your Python version, this, this guy can change as well. So, okay, so, so this is the, uh, these are the changes that you have to make in order to basically be able to observe Python from your open form solver, right? And uh, uh, which is the location of the Python header files, NumPy header files, and the Python library uh, executable, the SO file. 
Okay, so let's, again, let's do a sanity check. We have not added any code. Let's just clean and rebuild. And over here, hopefully, if we are lucky, we should see that we have now, uh, you know, WMake has automatically looked at our file options and added uh, the path to uh, the Python header files and the NumPy header files uh, doing the, as a compilation flag. And it has also added the path to the Python library files. And it has also added the, the linking command for the Python library over here. So we are in good shape. Okay, any questions thus far? Hopefully people are following this and it's making sense to them. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if, if people have any uh, uh, troubles. I'll wait one minute and then I can keep going. Uh, sorry, maybe uh, maybe it is soon to ask this question, but uh, you changed the uh, just a solver. Uh, there is no need to change something in the SRC on the libraries. Uh, uh, at the moment, there is nothing, uh, no need to change anything in the sense of the the open form uh, linked uh, libraries. It's it's no change in the solver. Only we are just giving it extra information about where Python is. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks for the question. So actually, since I cannot copy paste from my PDF, so let me quickly open up my. PowerPoint so that it makes things a little easier for me. Close this guy. Let's go over here. The issue is my PowerPoint frequently crashes, as you can see there. Okay, yeah, this should be fine. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, so let's proceed with, with trying to call, uh, call uh, Python from, from this new solver that we are developing, okay? So again, I'm going to do Vim. I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I am not on Visual Studio. Uh, it's, it's just a little, actually, you know what? Let me, let me open up Visual Studio. There is no hey, problem with that. Yes? Uh, yeah, just one quick question. Do you mind opening your uh, make options file again one more time? I just wanted to happy to do so. Let me do that. Anything oh. that's confusing you? No, I think yeah, I, I got what's what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so you know, I'm going to follow Bethany's lead and actually uh, uh, open up uh, Docker on the on, on on Visual Studio. I think it's a little easier. Uh, so, okay, so let me navigate to home. Okay. And again, I can open up the make files again. Again, we just changed the name of the solver, nothing fancy in the options. We just added the paths to uh, our headers and the path to our libraries. So, again, nothing very fancy. Okay, so this is a solver, which at the moment is essentially just a copy of simple form. So, you know, just to be consistent, we will name this new algo form uh, calling Python from an open form solver. So we have it documented. And over here, we can start now pasting some of this code for, for Python form interoperability. Okay, so let's uh, look at this first piece of code and I'll paste it and we can go walk through it line by line and then run it and compile it, okay? So let me write a comment over here, following code to, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, link with Python. Okay, so what am I doing over here? So I'm basically uh, enabling the Python C API. So the ability to, to call the Python interpreter and execute Python code. Uh, first, by including the Python header files over here. And, and secondly, over here by, um, uh, by uh, also calling the NumPy uh, header files. So NumPy header files are important for exchanging data, right? So at the end of the day, 
just calling a Python function does not require NumPy, but if you want to exchange data with the Python function, then for that reason, you need NumPy. And so we will be uh, requiring uh, these three lines for this particular thing. Right. Uh, sorry, these set of lines for initialize NumPy. These two definitions are essentially some standard definitions for, uh, well, I, I don't think we need this one, so that's fine. But this uh, definition is something that is uh, uh, intended to, to tell Python that a certain uh, version of NumPy is being used uh, and a certain convention should be used for, for calling functions. So this is a standard thing that is, that is in there. Let me also update this document. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so let's now compile this and see if we get any errors. So at this moment, what I will do is I will, I will essentially uh, include those lines and I will add a return zero over here. So what am I doing? I'm just going to compile this and uh, we will run this code uh, for a particular case. Uh, but in essence, we will not run anything at all because it will just uh, uh, execute these lines, go into the main function and immediately return out with uh, without any error, okay? So uh, in order to do that, actually, since I have opened up a terminal over here, let me just keep using this terminal. So over here, I'm again going to w clean and w make. Let's see if we have any errors. I have an error already. This initializes, ah, because I have use Python commands for uh, a Python commenting style. This is a problem when you work across multiple languages. So let's do that again. You can see everything runs fine. So that means uh, 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 our uh, open form compiler wmake uh, was able to uh, was able to detect the header files and the, and the NumPy header files and, 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 and con uh, construct the solver. So let's do something over here. Let me uh, uh, copy a tutorial that I will just use for demonstrating this particular uh, code. So, you know what we can pick up, let's say what we can pick up bits daily. It doesn't matter, anything is fine. Uh, bits daily should be fine and paste it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the pitch. So pitch daily is like a, a classic open form tutorial case. Everybody runs it to validate the deployments. So if I go to pitch daily over here and uh, change my, sorry, change my uh, solver to new algo form. I'm sorry, I'm using Vim inside Visual Studio. It feels stupid, but you know how much I like Vim. So you know, I'll go form over here. Uh, I can then all run this and you see what it's done. It's constructed a mesh and it's run new algo form, but there is literally no output over here. So uh, because we have uh, essentially just entered the main function and turn zero. So if I actually have an info command over here. Where I just uh, print that there is a function here that is that is uh, uh, that uh, that we have just entered the main function and I make this guy again hopefully there is no error my C++ syntax open form syntax is okay and you can then inspect this log file let me open up the log file here which does not show my response because it's probably going to the, so I have to remove the new log file. So let me just ignore new. Okay, so you can see over here that what, what has my new solver done? It has just entered the main function and then exited out peacefully. Everything is okay. It has detected all these header files, okay. So hopefully everybody's on board so far. Again, use the Slack if you have any questions or unmute yourself and ask questions, okay? 
Hope you're following along. Okay, so now we are uh, we are ready to then test out this this Python interpreter. Let's let's go ahead and see what else we can do. Okay, so uh, before we uh, make any changes, uh, we have I must uh, introduce this particular bug that actually we struggled with for uh, approximately a year to to fix before uh, uh, there were some people in Europe who helped us out a little. Uh, so let me go back in and, and, and just tell you what this is. Let me paste it first. So over here, when we actually enter the main function, if you are planning to use Python from the main function, that it's vital that you add these lines over here. So over here, and, and also to, uh, to hide the set root case lists option, okay? So why are we doing this? So uh, when we import NumPy from, uh, from OpenFOAM without adding these options, we actually end up getting a pretty, a segmentation fault, which uh, uh, for the longest time, we were not able to, uh, to decipher why that was happening. And, 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 and as you can see in the, in the previous example that Bethany showed, there wasn't an, a, any error with, with just for following this process. It was showing up in, in, num, in by open form. And so what we had to do over here was actually um, uh, edit the way open form deals with the, uh, with the command line for reading arguments. Uh, uh, specifically in terms of the files that are available in the case directory. Uh, 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 otherwise it would cause this error with NumPy. Now we are still looking into this. So we're not quite sure why this error is happening, but we have found a hack or a workaround that, uh, uh, that prevents uh, this from happening. So, uh, so this is something of a cautionary, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, tail without a lot of explanation. I apologize for that, but this is something we are still looking into. So again, I'm going to just uh, move the return zero to the end of these uh, include commands and we will go back, recompile our uh, code and hopefully everything will be fine. And then I will pause for maybe a couple of moments if people have questions or if they want to see some of the code that I used. So again, just running the solver, everything's great. So now you can see that it's uh, entered the main function. Okay, it's everything as well. It has created the mesh. It has created fields, which you can see from these, these things it has also selected a particular turbulence model, everything is okay. But before doing any sort of computation, I just tell it to exit out, leave us. Okay. And so, uh, uh, so that just tells us that our development is fine. It's, it's logical, it's making sense. Okay, I wanna have a 30 second or maybe a one minute pause over here. Uh, if, if people are having any trouble, um, uh, I see Han saying that, you messed up the make option hands. Do you want to unmute yourself and 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 uh, have me uh, point you to a solution? Sure. I, I already found the underscore ref directory, so I've copied that over. It builds now. I am getting a build error from the cut and paste, though. I'm I'm working on that next. Okay, great. So uh, let me know how that goes. Okay. Okay. So everything looking good. Hopefully we haven't done anything fancy at all. We have not used Python or NumPy. We have just uh, enabled the ability to do so. Uh, over here, we have just entered the, the main function, uh, put in some hacks to prevent NumPy from, from blowing up our code. And then we have said, okay, let's just leave. We just wanted to check that everything is working. Okay. That's the state of our, of our solver at the moment. Let's go in and, and, uh, now start calling the, Py the, the Python interpreter, okay? So what should we do over here? So let me just copy this code and we can go through this one at a time. So we will, again, after including these uh, commands, we will just add this information. So after creating the mesh, choosing this appropriate you know, uh, turbulence model and so on and so forth. 
I am actually now going to initialize Python. So, uh, so over here, when I say initialize Python, essentially what I'm talking about is uh, initialize the Python interpreter, just like you would when you, uh, when you uh, just type Python three into your command line. So now over here, the same thing is going to be happening from open form. The answer uh, you get from here is, is that Python initializes successfully. Then over here, we will be calling the NumPy function, which, uh, which is this guy over here, which we defined. That will import NumPy in the C++ code. Remember, since NumPy is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, used both on the Python side of things, as well as the C++ side of things, we need to import NumPy both places. So we will import NumPy over here. Uh, hopefully this works appropriately. And then we will run some code in the Python interpreter. So, so imagine you open the Python interpreter by typing Python three and over here, you know, you can, you can say import this, right? So we want to do the same thing, but uh, we want to do it from the C++ code that we compile. And so that is done using PyRun simple string. Okay, so we'll just make sure that the current working directory uh, which is over here is in the path uh, of, of, the, of the Python interpreter, okay? So uh, let's uh, go back and compile the code while the code is compiling. I will, uh, uh, I will uh, look at the Slack channel. Okay, so Roberto, you are asking for the new agroform.c as it is now. So as it is right now, uh, in, in front of, in, in, in the screen that you're seeing, I can copy paste this. Okay, okay, let me copy paste this and put it into the general state of new algo form dot C at 1015 CT, just to, okay, there you have it. Okay, so, all right. So, okay, code compiles all right. That's good news. You Let's go into the. Hand. I have a raised hand. Where oh, is... no. It's it's okay. It's okay. I just wanted to ask you to copy the code, so they don't. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hi, Demetrius. Yeah, sure. No worries. Uh, uh, and and then no need to raise hands, guys. Just just uh, uh, interrupt me. It's all good. Okay. All right, so let's go into my case directory now, and then uh, again run this guy. Hopefully, we will see some more standard output over here. Ah, there you are. So again, we had everything from here till the last time. And now we have been able to initialize Python. Uh, and we have also been able to run Python, uh, run, uh, you know, uh, basically commands in the Python interpreter by, by, for example, using the PyRun simple string. So over here, you could obviously paste an entire Python code to do something. Obviously, it's kind of pointless as you as you'd imagine because at this moment, uh, you don't know how to exchange data. But for example, you could import libraries like this and, and so on. Uh, but we really uh, haven't found many use cases of just running a simple string other than uh, to make sure that the, the path is, is available uh, to the Python interpreter. So that's the whole point of importing sys and appending the current path to the, direct, uh, to the, to the working directory. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. We can move on uh, to the next line, which is now the fun stuff, which is how to actually uh, import a Python module in open form, right? So let me copy this guy again. Uh, hopefully this, this format is not too jarring for everyone and, and hopefully you're enjoying yourself. Please uh, let me know if you want to change something. Okay, so over here, what am I gonna do? I'm going to load a Python module uh, uh, from a Python script in the working directory. Comment your code, it's important. Okay, okay, so, so what are these things over here? Okay, so the first uh, command over here is to, uh, is to basically uh, uh, tell C++ that within the particular case directory, which is pitch daily in this case, there will be a Python underscore module dot file, okay? 
And so, and, and this .py file should be imported. So, you know, whenever you're running Python scripts, if you have another .py file in the same directory, you know, you can just import that .py file or import functions from it, right? So we want to import this, this uh, .py file. Uh, and and for for that first we need to know what the name is. So there is a pi object which is which is a basically a struct uh, that the Python C API has for retaining information about about uh, certain Python instructions. So within this pi object we will uh, essentially uh, uh, you know decode a, a string to to so that you know you know where the uh, where a certain code is is kept and and then we will say import a module into another pi object uh, given this p name and then we don't need p name anymore after the in, in, in uh, after the import so we decrease the reference so it's it's this this line is similar to deallocation in c++ if people have done c and c++ coding in python garbage collection is automatic you have to just uh, decrease the reference so since you created a reference over here for the the name of the python module you want to then uh, remove the reference okay now, in this case, uh, let's let's run this code and see what happens, and you will see something interesting. So let's compile this guy. There are some errors over here, which are essentially because we are using some old style casting, etc. Please ignore these errors. Uh, let's go to uh, the case directory and let's run the code. Okay, so over here we got an error, right? And I was kind of expecting this error, but I wanted to, uh, to to see if people can tell me what this error is. So, question to members of the audience is me just making sure I, you know people are paying attention. What mistake have I made for this error to show up? You can uh, unmute yourself and reply, or, or you can try the Slack channel, whatever suits your fancy i think you just uh, don't have the module file in your current directory exactly we have a winner yes so so this is who who was that please introduce yourself um mokul from UW. Hi, mokul. yeah so i know at least one person is listening to us great so so mokul is exactly right so we kind of uh, we told C++ that there would be a you know .py file in the directory which should be called Python module, and this file was not available, right? So that's why it threw us this error that there is a missing import. So let's create this file, right? So let's uh, let me just not vim this time. Uh, you know what? I will use vim. Just easier. Okay. So over here, I'm just going to say, uh, what should I say? I'm going to uh, say print hello from module file. Okay, actually, I had something already over here. Yeah, hello from Python module. So let me copy this first line just to keep things consistent. And let's run this case again. See, I'm not recompiling now, I'm just running it again. Okay. And there you have it, right? The module was loaded correctly, and and because it was loaded properly, you you got this uh, got this message, hello from Python module. So, in other words, what exactly happened was Python three was initial initialized, and you said import Python module, and you and you and you basically got this message that I printed there. Okay. So now we have just done it from C++, okay? So, uh, okay, if we've imported Python module and now th this is the really cool thing. So I can now add things to this Python module. Oops, wrong window. I can add things to this Python module that don't need me to recompile uh, the, the solver. And, and this is because Python is an interpreted language. It's it's not a it's a script language. It's it's not a compiled language. So you could add as many instructions here as possible, as long as uh, you know you weren't uh, calling a function in the C C code, uh, but just modifying functions or modifying content over here. You could just go in and just run this code again, and now you see you're getting these uh, uh, these. Uh, 
these commands, which mean that NumPy was imported, matplotlib was imported. We won't even need matplotlib for today's workshop, but why the hell not? Uh, and, and over here, uh, uh, one of the things I did with a, with a friend of mine of, a few uh, years ago was while I was doing this research, was I actually embedded an email client into open form, right? Or a Twitter client to open form so that uh, whenever uh, open form finished a simulation or open form finished a certain number of iterations, uh, it would send me an email or send me a tweet telling me to, uh, to, look at, to look at open form. It could also, for example, use matplotlib to construct a visualization, embed that visualization into a tweet or an email and send it to me. So think of it, right? Isn't it cool? You're, you're running this code on your machine or a workstation or an HPC and you leave it be and then you, know, you get a tweet while you're outside telling you, oh, here's what the flow field looks like, right? Because you plotted in matplotlib and you uh, embedded it in a tweet and you got it by email. So that's the sort of functionality that this type of coupling enables, right? This is before you go into TensorFlow or PyTorch or anything. So I hope you can appreciate uh, you know, how, how fascinating uh, this is. Okay, so uh, I, I saw a question in the Slack. So um, uh, new error, cannot find file uh, uh, new algo form system. So you need to, uh, Hans, you need to uh, have copied the case. So uh, if you remember uh, within new algo form, there's a case, it's daily. So, uh, so in order to copy pits daily, what you need to do is, uh, let me go through that command again. Uh, it should be there in the in the uh, PDF that I sent you, but but let me put it here again. So if you go to foam tutorials, uh, incompressible, simple foam, there is a case called pits daily. You want to copy this into your current directory, right? Which I'm not going to run. But once you copy this into your current uh, directory, you can. Uh, uh, then go into pits daily and vim the system control dict, which will open up uh, basically the control options. You can change this to new algo form. Okay, hope that answered your question. Okay, can you copy and paste the uh, the CP or is it in the folder already or in the, uh, the instructions? It's it's in the instructions. So let me tell you which page I'm talking about. So it's uh, uh, let's see, did I not put it somewhere? Okay, um, I apologize. I, I think I missed it in the instruction. So let me uh, let me also put it over here. So let me. Uh, so this is the this is how it goes when you uh, have live, live testing. I understand. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that, but thank you for catching that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let me duplicate this slide. Uh, let's copy a case. And over here, we want uh, actually this guy over here and uh, Vim with the system. Control dict. Oh. Okay, so uh, I'm going to copy this and put it in the Slack, but I'll also update the slides, okay? Okay, good catch. Thank you. Uh, and by solver, you mean new application, the application name? Uh, sorry, uh, not the solver, the case, case, you're right. Yeah, so this is this is us copying a case, a tutorial case, and and just uh, uh, when you change the, uh, the application, yes, application. You change the application at simple form from, let me make it even more, to the alpha. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep, trying it now. Okay, great. Okay, so good catch. I had, I had not actually gone through that particular, uh, I had not documented that particular thing. So I'll make sure to update that in the updated slides. Thanks, Hans. 
Okay, so uh, where were we? Let's go back to our code. Okay, so so far we have just imported a function, uh, imported a module, we haven't imported functions and we have demonstrated how you can add multiple things to the, to the Python module and not have to recompile, right? That's the nice thing. So, uh, so that is uh, cool. Let's go in and now start looking at how to actually add functions, right? So we, we were able to load a, load a module. Uh, we were able to put things into that module. Now we can uh, actually call some functions, okay? So before we actually call the function, we need to give the C++ code. We have a little bit of information about what the name of the function is and how many arguments it takes. So that is this portion over here. So uh, inform open form about uh, what functions, what function name is and how many arguments it takes. So over here, uh, uh, there is another Py object, just like the previous ones, where I uh, where I just say that within the module that I imported, P module, uh, there is a function that is called my underscore func, right? And I'm also going to define another Py object called my func args, which is a tuple. You know, in Python, you define a tuple uh, using using the square brackets, uh, which uh, has only one element. So this basically is telling us that my func should have only one argument, okay? And so if I, again, recompile this guy over here, hopefully no errors, just that it's unused. I have another small pop quiz for our audience. So when I run this code, uh, do people think there will be an error or do you think it will not be an error and why? Again, it's about my function. That's Sorry? It is, a, it is about my function. Maybe it okay. will have an error. Okay, so we have one person who says it will have an error. Uh, do we have any counter arguments for that? No counter arguments. Okay, so, so let's, let's try it. Let's see if we get the error. No errors. Why? Can someone hypothesize why there are no errors? If you are only getting the name, uh, defining exactly. the name, and that's it. yeah. So over here, we 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 are only telling C plus plus that there is a function in the module called my func. We are not calling it yet. Okay, so we could have anything over here. It doesn't matter. Until we call it, we will not get an error. Okay. So that's, a, that's why I sort of asked that question. It's, uh, and then, you know, uh, when I first was looking into this, I also figured that there should be an error here because I haven't defined my func, right? So, so that's the, that's the uh, idea I wanted to get across over here. Okay, so, so, so let's see what we need to do next to actually call this function. Uh, of course, we need to define it in Python. So I will do that. Uh, so I'm sorry, my cat, I have three cats at home and I'm alone and they are harassing me, so apologies. Okay, so let's, let's define this function now and, and see uh, what happens. Nothing will change naturally because uh, again, the pi function is not being called, okay? Uh, again, uh, since I'm just adding material to a Python module, I don't need to recompile and just do it again, nothing happens. My function is not loaded. That's why this print statement doesn't show up. I just have told C++ that there's a function that has a certain number of arguments, okay? Now let's try to call this function, okay? So that happens in slide 16. Uh, let's see, uh, did I just add information before calling the function? Okay, so the function is called in slide 18. So, okay, so let's let's follow the slides and, and, and do it appropriately, okay? 
All right, so when we are calling a function, of course, what we want to you know, end up really doing is to, is to send it some information from open form, right? So over here, the function is taking an argument A, we would like A to be uh, an array, a NumPy array, because remember, we are using NumPy for exchanging data between Python and open form. And we want to perform some operations on A and return another NumPy array, okay? So that is the most typical approach uh, of, 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 uh, for, for using this coupling. So in order to do that, uh, we can't natively send scalar fields or vector fields that OpenFORM uses as its native data structure into, into Python because Python will break in that case. So what we have to do in that case is, uh, is essentially uh, uh, generate some sort of a buffer where we can store this uh, 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 open form data, okay, over here, uh, where uh, which which can then be sent into uh, Python after casting to NumPy, okay. So let's go over this line by line, okay. So uh, so it's this comment is slightly inaccurate. We should say preparing data for sending to Python, okay. So what is this data? So over here, we, we are just defining a, a, an array object over here for, for by object. This will, uh, the, the, the purpose of this will, will be clear shortly, okay? In addition, what I'm doing over here is I am um, just capturing the number of cells there are. So, you know, open form is a finite volume code. We are just looking at how many cells there are in the code by using this command 106, the line 106. And we are defining an array. Uh, because again, open form takes arrays. It does not have connectivity information. It can't natively use the data type that, uh, that sorry, Python cannot natively use the data type that open form has. Uh, and, and within this uh, uh, this array, we will we will say that there are you know a certain number of rows, a certain number of columns, and we will populate this information with uh, with information from the velocity field. Okay, so over here. This uh, these these lines are essentially a, a for loop, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, you know uh, is it places the x component of the velocity field in, in the first column and the y component of the velocity field in the second column, and uh, then this array is ready for well it's not ready but you know we could use this for um, for um, uh, placing this in the uh, in the NumPy function, right? Okay, so for this, obviously, since we made changes to the C++ code, we have to uh, recompile our solver. So let me do that. Again, there is no problem. These variables are fine. Okay, and uh, again, if you go into our case and run new algo form, there should be no error except that this, this set of line has been executed and we have actually generated an input valves that uh, an array that, uh, that has this information from the velocity field that we, we may wish to use in, in Python for some data analysis or visualization or, or so on and so forth, okay? All right, so let's, uh, let's see what we need to do to get this ready to uh, send over to, to Python, okay? So, so before, uh, uh, yeah, so let, let's do that, okay? All right, so let me copy this code. And here is where, you know, uh, the main uh, data type trans data, trans the, the main process before data transfer happens. So uh, cast to NumPy before uh, uh, sharing reference with Python. Okay, so over here, I'd like to note that when we are actually sending, when we will actually send data to my function, we are not gonna copy the data, okay? We are just going to send a reference, right? A pointer to Python, for to the to the array. But the thing is Python cannot, again, work on regular double precision arrays. It, can, it can't work directly on input valves. It can only work on uh, NumPy arrays, okay? So in order to do so, we have to do a couple of things. So we have to use this command called pi array simple new from data, which constructs a, a NumPy array. So this is a function from the NumPy C array data type, a NumPy uh, C API. 
Over here, we have a, um, uh, a, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, flags over here. The, you know, one of these is, is the data type. So we know we are talking about double precision. So we specify that as a flag. We give it the pointer to the, uh, to the first, um, uh, uh, you know, to the first element of the, uh, uh, of the input values we created, this array we created, because that's where it will start creating the data from. Uh, this dim variable is basically telling um, NumPy about how many, what the dimensions are of, of this array to be created, which is in this case, num cells by two. And this first argument two is just telling us that the NumPy array will be two dimensional. So it'll be a matrix essentially. So if, for example, this had to be three, there would be another entry over here, okay? And then uh, what we will do after this is we will specify that this array that we have created, I remember, I remember we defined uh, this array object over here uh, in the past. Uh, uh, this array that we have created is the first argument of the tuple. So you remember we had a tuple which had just one entry, which was supposed to be sent to the, uh, to, to the Python uh, function. Uh, to the Python interpreter, so the this, this tuple now has is has been populated by by uh, this two D array. Okay, all right. So we we have uh, this going. Let's again go back, compile the solver. Hopefully, people are falling around and it's uh, and and they are not lost. Feel free to you know uh, use the Slack channel if you're lost. And let's. Again, run this code. Again, it runs without any any anything. We should probably add more output statements to to make this a little more clear. So let me do that now. So created. Uh, Okay, just a little more documentation. Let's see what happens. Okay, so you see uh, it it runs appropriately all the way through to line one twenty nine, and you can see that. Uh, you know, uh, our, our code is doing what, what at least it, it should be doing. Okay. So uh, we are all set to call the function. We just haven't called it yet, right? Uh, what we will do in the function is, is, is a separate thing. We will basically be sending this array, which contains the U and V components of, of, of the velocity, uh, sorry, X and Y components of the velocity. And we will, we will uh, have access to it within Python. So let's see how the the function is called after this. So we have done all of this. Okay, this is the fun part. This is when the function is called. And this is where my func needs to be there in your in your code. So okay. Over here we will finally call my func while passing it my the, the tuple of arguments, which in this case is just the array. And over here the function will return something to us. And when it returns something to us, we can also investigate what that is uh, by, uh, by uh, 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 essentially uh, doing a, little, a cast to the, to, to the type that is returned and, uh, and then uh, print it out using uh, printf. I, I don't know why I use printf here. I was probably sleepy. You can just use info. So, uh, Okay, so 
Okay, so so this will compile fine if I'm not mistaken. But in order to make this run, now we need to have a uh, a function over here that uh, that does something with this numpy array, right? And here that's where all the flexibility starts coming in. So over here, for example, I can uh, did I make the change? No, I did not. Okay, so. Uh, so let me copy this particular function and put this inside. Okay. Okay, so what am I doing over here? So all I'm doing is I'm taking this array that I sent in. If you remember, the rows are the different, uh, 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 you know, cells in our grid and the columns are the components of the velocity. I'm just computing the sum of this matrix. It's it's a useless thing, but it's it 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 explains what we are trying to do, and I am then returning the sum after making sure that it is a you know double precision uh, data type because Python does weird things with types. We want to make sure we have explicit control on the type that is being uh, returned because if you sent in a float thirty two, uh, C plus plus will give you a garbage output and uh, or it might crash. Uh, um, uh, in addition, uh, I also make sure that my output uh, or my return value is is actually a numpy array. Uh, you know, uh, just to to remind folks, uh, data exchange from Python functions can only be done as numpy arrays, right? At the moment, uh, there are some uh, some more complex tricks you can play to exchange non-numpy objects uh, by by uh, by calling the definition of the object and embedding that into c++ but for today we are we are just dealing with numpy arrays so so for example you can exchange classes and then uh, if you the definition of the class is available to you in c++ as well as python then you can dereference uh, you know members of the class object so that's obviously possible but over here what we are doing is we are just uh, uh, returning a numpy array because that that's the easiest thing to do making sure that the type is, is correct. I always, this is very important. Let me add this as a comment. Very, very important. Return data as array and make sure type is appropriate. Okay, so so this thing is done. Okay, and within within this particular, uh, so so the return is, is stored as an array object in, in P value. And we can again use some numpy functions, which is pi array underscore get ptr, uh, which is nothing but the uh, but the dereference operator in a numpy array. So, for example, if you want element i and uh, uh, element uh, j of a two-dimensional matrix, you would do a square brackets i comma j right in Python. Since this is a one-dimensional array, all you have to do is uh, give it the array object p value and say uh, which uh, uh, which element you want to to dereference and then cast it to double using this a pointer to a double and then dereference that pointer over here. So uh, uh, so over here since our array is essentially one dimension only because it's it's just one element in a in a in an array the just setting it to zero Python starts to zero after all just setting it to zero gives you uh, uh, gives you the value that you wish to wish to output right. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to compile this guy. And uh, did I already compile it? But let me do it again. Yes, I did. And then uh, let me go into my run case and then run this guy. Thing is crossed. Okay, so something went wrong. Uh, because my sum was returned as zero. Why was that? Okay, over here, I'm, I'm going to make sure that my array has the right values and put that to ID. I think um, is it because like the initial condition has all zero velocities and we ah have... yes 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 okay uh, that's a very good catch Mukul thank you thank you uh, so 
this is in some sense uh, completely correct. Uh, so uh, the initial condition for this particular field is, uh, is, is all zeros uh, uh, because I picked up bits daily. Um, what, uh, what we can do very quickly, let's see if we can do it, is, is pick up another case and see if this shows up properly. Good catch. So the code is working fine, basically. So let's see, we can pick up the uh, airfoil case, let's say, paste it here. So let's go to the airfoil case. This is the, this is, uh, um, I know this case has a non-zero initial condition. So over here, I okay, can, um, okay. Even for pitch daily, if you just simply run simple form and then change uh, the initial time to like the latest time and control. Yeah. Like yep. 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 Good catch. Good catch. So I was befuddled for a while there. Okay. So let's run the airfoil case. And again, I did not copy my, <laughs> my uh, Python module. So I got that error. There you have it. Okay, so so what you're seeing over here is is the sum that is returned from um, uh, a couple of you know different uh, uh, computations. The first computation that you're seeing over here is uh, coming actually from the uh, from the Python function, which is within here, right? And the second computation is happening. From within C plus uh, plus. Uh, no, the second computation. There is only one computation. Let me let me rewind. The second uh, output is is just the data that is dereferenced uh, as as we receive it back in uh, 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 C plus plus. And of course, over here you can see that there is a uh, there is a representation issue that we can fix. But uh, I will. Leave that to the audience because I don't remember off the top of my head what the flags were for dereferencing for 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 the floating point representation. Um, okay, so or maybe I can just use the command I had here. So use printf. Maybe that's why I use printf. Okay. There you have it. So you see, with the NumPy, you get slight a slight difference in the precision. So you end up having a three nine 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 point three nine nine rather than a point four. So uh, usually in CFD, we don't really worry about such issues. You know, differences in the uh, in in the I don't know the eighth or ninth decimal place, but uh, something it's good to, I guess, keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so far we have been able to compute the, the, the sum of, of this particular uh, array in, in Python. The very interesting thing over here is that you can, uh, you can actually now plot things over here. So now I'm going to do a little bit of freestyling here. I did not prepare this, but bear with me. Okay. I'm going to make a plot of, of this, uh, of this uh, matrix that uh, that was sent to me. It's going to be a long, thin matrix. Uh, or, or should I just uh, make a scatter plot? So, a. Another thing I'd like to uh, mention was uh, the uh, a good sanity check for making sure that your Python module is doing uh, is is okay in terms of um, in terms of uh, syntax issues and stuff is to just try to run it from the um, from the directory. So you know over here it's just 
you know, running it from the command line and there are no errors, which means that there are no syntax errors. So, so that's, that's usually a, a nice thing. Okay, so now what we can do is, again, I'm not gonna change anything. I just, uh, I will just run this code again. And hopefully now there should be a plot that is generated. Okay, so this, this is done. I don't need bits daily, I need FOIL2D. And there you have it. There is a plot, which for some reason does not show up. Why does it not show up? It might be because there is a, identical value. Okay, this is, I'm just uh, freestyling over here. So it's possible that uh, I can also do this. This has to change. Okay. So you can see this is the nice thing about uh, uh, prototyping with Python, right? I can quickly do inspections. I can, I don't need to recompile my solver every time. I can quickly plot. Uh, and, and things. So, so this is my plot. My, it looks like it's a uniform initial condition, which is why for each cell you have the same value of, of the x velocity, right? So I'm just plotting it here and saving it. Uh, you could once you save this plot, you can do many things with it, right? So, so that's that's nice. You can even call this function at each time within your, uh, within your uh, solver, uh, and then see how that plot uh, evolves. Okay. So let's carry on. Again, uh, if you're missing something, please feel free to use the Slack, but also don't worry, this, this, uh, this thing is being recorded, okay? All right, so let's carry on. What, what, what else can we do? We can, we can run another check for uh, the computation that we were doing, the sum, uh, and, and make sure that it matches uh, what was happening inside Python, but I'm sure. This is not required. So over here, all I'm doing is I'm performing the same operation that was happening inside Python with NumPy sum. I'm just doing it in C++ uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, just as a sanity check. So I'm going to go back, clean, make, Okay, so you see uh, everything looks appropriate. So this is the sum that is being printed in Python. This is the sum that is being returned from Python and printed in C++. And this is the sum that is calculated in C++. And all of them match quite nicely. So this kind of make sure that our data transfer, data uh, processing, data return, is, is appropriate. And so now you can use what we have done over here to, to really go crazy, essentially, right? You can do so many things with the data that you have sent in, uh, data science, machine learning, and so on and so forth, because this data you could, for example, collect in a large array, use it for training, uh, or use it online for, for tracking some statistics in a, in a plot that you keep updating, uh, lots of possibilities, essentially, okay? So at this moment, I think uh, you know we are uh, we are making good time. So I will stop and uh, and let folks uh, chime in and ask any questions, or ask me to go through any steps again uh, for greater clarity, or or anything to say. It's all good. Uh, sorry, can I ask some questions regarding? Sure, your sure. Okay, so sorry, in your case, uh, the inputs uh, uh, for the function in Python is uh, velocity, right? Yes, in this case, I'm, I'm just sending it. Uh, 
So I'm sending it this essentially, right? This this array that I defined, which okay. which it is two dimensional array. The first dimension is the number of degrees of freedom, essentially number of points, number of cells. Second dimension is it, it, it has two columns, and, and and the two columns are the x component of velocity and the y component of velocity, and then convert this basically into a big matrix, right? And okay. convert it into a NumPy array, which I which I do over here. And this NumPy array is then sent in over here. So A is a NumPy array. Okay, so in this function, for instance, I want to use a neural network in Python and mm -hmm. to, uh, for instance, uh, all of the, uh, the neural network algorithm is included in my function, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, so you would have to, for example, import TensorFlow here, right? And then you could, uh, you could define a, I don't know, like a class object here for TensorFlow and then, you know, uh, build your model within, within this function. And this function can also call other functions, right? So if you, for example, define another func here, uh, which does nothing, return zero, then you can also call another func, right? Actually, that's a good question. So let's say I send in, uh, this guy and and do um, uh, uh, I don't know uh, what should I do with with a in this function? Let me say return two times a. Okay, so again, since this is coming back to Python only, I don't have to worry about type casting and things, right? So I just send it a over here, and I can print something here like uh, this is the sum of b equals to a and i can just print np dot sum b okay and over here again i added this new function i did not have to change anything over here because i'm not calling another func from c i'm just calling it from python so i can run this guy again uh, if there is no syntax error i just imported tensorflow and there you go Okay. Okay. So, sorry, I had a problem in my connection. Uh, it is okay. Yes. And uh, my other question is that uh, when I uh, want uh, where in uh, in uh, you know in that C file in the solver. You want to what? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Do you hear me right now? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I, I didn't catch that uh, word. You wanted something in the C file? Yes. Yes. Uh, I want to import right now. Import the results of Python to the solver. Where did you okay. do that? I didn't understand. Oh, that. okay. That's a that's a good question. So so I don't have that here, but I can point you to a. Uh, uh, so for example, you can you can do this, right? Uh, you can take this for loop. So for loops in C are good, right? So what you can do is you can take this for loop, and over here you can just flip, right? You can you can um, let me see. Uh, let me pull up. Sample. Bear with me one moment. So that's a good question. So the question is, okay, how how do you uh, actually um, uh, load the data into the open form uh, data structure? This is a uh, this is something kind of uh, it's an open form question. It's not really a Python question. So over here, once you get the get the return value from uh, from Python, which is like, for example, this guy over here, you can, uh, you can uh, essentially, you can uh, extract the components of the, of the uh, vector field, right? So uh, U is a vector field over here. So you can extract the components, UX, v, v, U, V, W, uh, and then uh, write another for all loop to, to embed that uh, into the uh, into the so this is there in the Docker folder essentially. Okay, does that make sense, or did I butcher it? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, so 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 that's me, essential. Yes. Sorry, I think we have another question from Sen. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have a question. Um, when I look at this, I see that in terms of open form, um, 
the coding framework, it seems like uh, this porting can, it's encapsulated as a, the idea is to additional, is an additional processing on the, the open form is the vote scalar field or geometric field. So that seems like, is it possible to actually port this to a function object in open form? And then we can specify, basically use that as a library. And then we have additional parameters, for example, the pi function or pi module specifying the case file. Sure. And so no, once that, that, that is done, it's... Uh, it's much yeah. easier. Yes, yes, so, I agree. So so that that we, we, we have explored that, but the reason I guess we want to uh, have people know this, what we did over here, rather than make it a black box, is that uh, we, we may not always just need the velocity, right? We could wish to, uh, for example, uh, do many things like give it, um, uh, I don't know, like mesh coordinates, right? Uh, I, I'm working with, with some colleagues over here to do adaptive mesh refinement with machine learning. In that case, the mesh coordinates are input to a to a to a data driven framework, right? And they are they are uh, updated. Uh, we could, for example, exchange um, uh, information about you know turbulent eddy viscosity. So by putting it as a uh, you know as a function object. Um, uh, it, it, I mean, it can be done, and it would have to be sufficiently expressive to, uh, to, to allow for transferring whatever data you want, right? But yeah, I agree. For the purpose of just exchanging velocity data, yes, you could, you could very easily make it a function object. But I think like going through this process is valuable because it just tells you what's happening under the hood. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting talk. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so I, I know that this was quite a bit of material to, to digest. So um, I propose if the other instructors are okay with it, uh, a 15-ish minute break uh, before which I can come back and uh, discuss the end of today's uh, topics, which is a, a more high level sort of discussion of the other examples that are there in, uh, in the Docker container. And uh, and once I'm done with those, uh, time permitting, we can discuss also, uh, for example, working with turbulence models, which is something that interests me quite a bit. Uh, uh, how to edit turbulence models to exchange data from a from a uh, uh, from a uh, sort of a a open form module itself rather than the open form main function. Over here, we are doing everything in the open form main function. Open form also. For example, has these sort of these modules it can call, for example, turbulence uh, solvers. So we might want to figure out how to call uh, call a machine learning code within this particular operation. So uh, it, time permitting, we can go into that. But uh, again, it's not super crucial, and we can sort of use Slack to uh, to relay the the highlights for that. Okay, so uh, I I, I uh, propose a break till. 11, let's say 20, or maybe 11.25, what, what do people think? I'm open to suggestions. Uh, I'm gonna stay here, so maybe maybe let's, let's target 11, uh, 11 20, 11 20. Uh, and, and uh, so 40 minutes, you guys can go over some of the material, the, some of the slides, try to follow my steps. And uh, maybe I will take questions for five minutes after that, and I can start with the new material. Okay. So we are 30 minutes away from the end of the workshop. Um, again, this was our first attempt at doing something like this. So our breaks were not evenly spaced. Apologies for that. Um, I was told uh, to uh, let everyone know that, at least for the people who have, who have joined us today, I will be um, communicating with you uh, after the end of this workshop, maybe uh, maybe today, maybe a few days later via email. Uh, and that email will also have a survey link. And uh, I, I would be very, uh, uh, you know, very grateful if you can go into that survey link and actually answer some of the questions over there. We will mainly be collecting information about uh, what you've learned, uh, what you think it's similar to the entry survey, but in this case, we will also collect some feedback about uh, 
what you thought about the workshop, what things we can improve, uh, what we did well. Uh, this will really help us for next year's uh, uh, stuff. So uh, thanks in advance for that. Uh, so uh, since we only have half an hour left, uh, and I, I did want to uh, show some uh, material that we have in the Docker container that you can play around with your leisure at your leisure. Uh, I figured perhaps we can um, um, uh, we can have a question answer session if if people are so inclined at this moment for five minutes, uh, or I can dive straight into the uh, into one of these examples where I'm using deep learning. Um, uh, and and uh, and just walk through the code if 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 uh, if that is of interest. So, um, um, any any suggestions, any um, any requests from the audience? Uh, I'd be happy to take them. If not, then I will just assume that I can keep going, and I'll wait for uh, people to uh, uh, interrupt me. Okay, so let me share my screen very quickly. Okay, so uh, we, we left off here and, um, and, and this last section uh, essentially has a, uh, an overview of, of the things that are available in the Docker container that are a good starting point for maybe some of your research. So for example, in, in, in the Docker container, actually, let me uh, also open up the container while I have you. Uh, you will, uh, in addition to the hands-on examples, you will see a couple of folders. I don't need this guy anymore. You will see a couple of folders which are called the solver examples and the turbulence model examples. So I don't think I can go through the turbulence model examples today because it's also a specified science. Uh, we can do this over Slack with people who are interested. So contact me there. But for the solver examples, this is basically, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, going through what we did with the hands-on today, but actually doing it for some, some science, right? So, and specifically over here, we will be uh, following uh, a tight coupling algorithm like, like Bethany introduced for doing some in-situ data processing, okay? And so uh, what do, are our algorithms doing? So the first algorithm, uh, more or less all the algorithms that are there in the Docker container follow this particular sort of algorithm, which is you have, um, uh, you know, data that is coming in that is streaming in from a simulation and you want to extract, you know, some coherence structures or you want to extract some uh, compressed representation using an autoencoder. That's the example I'll show you, right? Uh, and the way the algorithm works is that you'll initialize your solver, your, your Python and C API coupling using the pi initialize and so on and so forth that, that I went through. And what you will do now is that you will now do an integration with the solver where, you know, just like we did, we'll send our uh, open form data to Python by first casting it to a NumPy array. Uh, and uh, what we will do is uh, we will not immediately do analysis on the NumPy array because you remember in, in a lot of deep learning applications or machine learning applications, you have to collect batches of data, right? So we'll collect batches of data, store them in some uh, in, Py in some Python uh, um, array or list, and then after a certain checkpoint is uh, is um, is uh, is hit, we will perform the deep learning or the data analysis, send that data back to Open Form, and we can uh, that open that data in Open Form can be used for. Uh, you know, for, for example, uh, Paraview, you can use Paraview to visualize that data that you send back. So in some sense, even the visualization can be done, but you could visualize in Python as well. So, so, uh, so let me uh, give you a quick example of this. So uh, someone requested a deep learning example. So let's do that. So I'm just going to walk through the code this time rather than code it with you guys. Uh, for lack of time. So over here, I have a new solver, which I've called AE form. Actually, this should be AE form. Dot C, it's called autoencoder form. And over here, what I'm essentially doing is, is nothing strange at all. I'm importing Python. I'm adding that hack that prevents that NumPy, uh, that NumPy crash. Uh, and over here, uh, uh, what I do when I start my time loop is that after a certain number of iterations, so while I'm running, and this is a transient case, so this is not simple form, this is simple form. 
So uh, there's the, here the, the iterations are not pseudo time, they are actual time. But while you are actually doing these iterations, you, you, uh, you, you, you update your velocity, you update your pressure, you do your turbulence model in this case, and then finally you talk to Python. Okay, so what I'm doing over here, here, this is just some uh, measurement of how much time is required to do something. But what I, what I do within the uh, time step, at each time step, I call Python. And what I do in Python is, uh, is uh, depending on whether it is a time to write something out to disk or not. Don't worry about following this code too closely. It's in there in the Docker and, and this recording will be available. Uh, depend if, if it is uh, not a time to do the data analysis, I basically uh, uh, just take the X component of the velocity for this particular case. I, I send it, this is exactly the same code I showed you uh, earlier today. I'm just going to send it over to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Python by calling a function called encode func, right? And this, this encode func uh, was actually also loaded in, in Python create.h. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So there is a Python create.h that I call over here. Here I am I'm basically defining all those uh, you know, pointers to objects that I'll be needing to store my Python module, that I'll be needing to store my different functions and, uh, and also um, uh, certain uh, data structures in open form that I'll need. For example, you remember the input value data structure. I will also need some output data structures that I construct over here. And uh, within, the, uh, within the each time step, uh, if, if I'm collecting data, I call the encode function. Uh, and if I am, uh, if I am, uh, 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 sorry, if I'm collecting the data, I, uh, I, uh, I call the snapshot function. So, so let's open up the case and look at these functions. I didn't want that. What did I do? So over here, you can see this is a much more complex Python uh, uh, module file compared to uh, this the rather simple one previously over here, of course, I like thoroughly defined a, a TensorFlow model. I, I basically this is uh, this is you know deep learning um, uh, you know deep learning a deep learning uh, uh, you know example. So I defined a class object where uh, within this particular class I defined a auto encoder module uh, model. Again, uh, don't worry about the details. Just think of it as a as a model that takes the input and then uh, tries to compress it uh, by learning the identity function and going through a, a very small latent space, right? And within this particular function, you do you have models. You have the uh, uh, the the call for training. You have uh, the path uh, for saving the model and so on and so forth. And um, so what we would be doing in this particular example, again, at each time step is, uh, is basically called the snapshot function. So let's look at the snapshot function. This is not important. So within the snapshot function, what we do is we are, uh, we are basically collecting snapshots from the, uh, from the array that's coming in, you remember that there was a, an array that is being sent in from C++. Uh, this uh, problem is also parallelized. So you can also send in information of which rank that array is coming from. And so you can uh, collect this array over time uh, 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 and, and, and essentially uh, uh, record it in a global variable. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, and within uh, then uh, after you have collected the snapshot for a certain amount of time, so if, uh, if basically uh, you are finished collecting your training data, then you can actually um, uh, start testing it. So over here, we are going to call the autoencoder func, uh, which is uh, nothing but uh, this, uh, uh, where was it? Yeah, th this um, example, uh, this function where over here, I give it the snapshots that I collected and I train this, uh, this model uh, and, 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 and then basically uh, release the data from memory because I don't need those snapshots anymore. I already tested, right? I already trained. 
Okay, so after finishing this autoencoder uh, training, uh, what we do is we change the encode uh, encode mode. So what this means is, uh, uh, you know, uh, initially I was not encoding. So encoding in the autoencoder means compressing. So initially I was just collecting data and not really compressing anything. So that's why my encode mode was zero. It's a global, it's a global variable. Over here, I changed encode mode to one, which means that now my deep learning method is ready to go. So it's ready to be used. And so uh, once my encode mode is one over here, instead of collecting data, which I do from line 71 onwards, I will actually encode data. Okay, so, so this is what I will do. And uh, in this encoding uh, 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 function, uh, I, I essentially just, um, uh, in, in some sense, I, I don't compress, although uh, for the purpose of explanation over here, I compress and then reconstruct as well. So you can think of this action as, a, uh, as a sending the original data in there, uh, encoding it, and then uh, reconstructing it as well, because uh, you know, uh, in this case, we only wanted to see if we do use an autoencoder, how much information is uh, is in some sense lost due to the process of encoding. And so, uh, so, so when encode mode is one, we we are basically collecting the decoded field back into this UREC uh, um, uh, uh, data structure, which means a U reconstructed data structure. And over here, since we have a two-dimensional array, uh, basically we have a, uh, the 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 cell as the row, and the and the column is is basically just one-dimensional. So we we use get ptr two, but we could also use get ptr one, and just removes the zero over here. And uh, similarly over here, if if encode mode is one, and we are currently uh, in the, in a in a time that we are writing our data to disk, we can actually uh, we can actually uh, write out uh, the encoded uh, or the reconstructed field as its own uh, sort of uh, output file, right? So, uh, and and that's the basic idea. So, what does this mean? It means that initially we start the simulation, we collect data for a certain amount of time, we train a model. Uh, then we use that model to, to reconstruct the data uh, uh, for a certain amount of time. Then we, uh, uh, we print out the reconstructed data at a certain time. And then we again start collecting data. Then we train a model. So it's kind of happening uh, interchangeably, right? So that's the way this works. So uh, again, we have 15 minutes left. So let me quickly go through this, this particular example and see if we can make this run. So we can go to solver examples a form so uh, again uh, we can uh, i have already compiled this so we can just go to the run case and uh, let's just run this guy oops what's wrong okay i have to run it Okay, so let's see what the log looks like. Okay, you see, so, uh, so it's collecting snapshots now initially. Uh, it will collect this uh, until a certain number of iterations. Uh, you can, um, uh, it will show up soon when that is done. Again, this is kind of slow because, yeah. So, so it collected a certain number of iterations and these iterations, it was 400, uh, are then used to start a deep neural network training. As you can see, this training is happening within uh, open form, which is nice. And this training is saved to an H5 file, as you can see, which can be you know, recovered uh, later on. So we don't actually save the data, we just save the train model. So eventually this training will terminate because the loss does not improve anymore. Uh, we use the validation loss to determine if the uh, training is actually any good. 
So it's still improving. So the first time this happened, I was very excited because uh, performing a neural network training from open form is, uh, it really solves a lot of problems, right? So uh, I think it's uh, uh, quite, quite nice, especially if you're working with really large data sets and have access to GPUs, uh, really accelerates things. So, so let's see how long this takes. I hope it doesn't go all the way up to 1000, but it's possible. So after the training is finished, basically we will uh, just be using the train model to, uh, to um, reconstruct the flow field and, and also show the reconstruction in, in Paravia. So, so yeah, so I've kind of raced through this, but you know, uh, feel free to go through the Docker and explore the other examples uh, and use the Slack channel to you know leave questions for us. Uh, uh, I just want to have one example where I can visualize how the reconstruction looks like. So yeah, uh, sorry about that, guys. This is going to take a while. Uh, could I ask one question? Yes, please go ahead. So how about parallel running? Uh, can the uh, machine learning training part uh, uh, run parallel? Like That's a very good question. So at the moment, uh, we have not uh, released an example where the ML training is also parallelized. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a, a, a regular Python code that can be parallelized, so you can have uh, you can share the MPI communicator between C++ and Python, and that uh, gets the job done. Okay. But if you, uh, if you are uh, parallelizing the deep learning, you need to use like something like Horovod. So, and that there may, there have been some compatibility issues in that case, uh, which we are still sort of figuring out, but in a, in a, in a nutshell, yes, it's possible. So if you go into this, uh, uh, this, this other directory, let me open my, so over here, there is another example called APMOS form. So this is, and if you look at the paper that accompanies Python form, you'll see that this is a parallel SVD algorithm. So you, you deploy the open form in parallel and NumPy is also in parallel or Python is also in parallel. Uh, but to do TensorFlow in parallel, you have to use something like Horovod, which uh, we, we are still, I mean, we haven't really looked into that uh, quite yet. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. So the package that you mentioned. Sorry. What was the name of the parallel package you mentioned? Oh, Horovod. H O R O V O D. So let me just put that in this slide. Horovod. Okay. So I think uh, we can stop running this case. See what we ended up with. Okay, so we had a couple of outputs. So le uh, let's see how these look like. So over here, if I then run Paraform, again, this is very nice. So you can uh, visualize your open form cases within the Docker container on your local machine through, through Paraform. So, okay, so let's, let's look at all the things that are available to us here. So you see there are these U recs, right? These reconstructions are, are the autoencoder uh, predictions essentially. So we can uh, choose a particular time. We can, oh, for the first time there is no reconstruction because we just calculated data and we predicted. So the second time there will be a reconstruction and as you can see, the reconstruction is not very good at all, which is, which is fine because we have to train this better uh, compared to the truth. Uh, oh, actually it looks like the, the, the training diverged, the, the, the simulation diverged itself. So, so in this case, I'm sorry, I did not, uh, I wasn't able to give you a good result, but uh, 
but the overall idea over here is that you know you're also able to output the reconstruction and it should match the truth sufficiently well but in this case the truth itself has diverged it looks like so um, so we will have to probably figure out something that is wrong with the solver I don't have the exact case over here, but in, in the paper that accompanies this, uh, we do have a case that is uh, converged and accurate. So uh, uh, I'll put it on my to-do list to add that specific case to the Docker and update the Docker container soon. So yeah, so, so that is basically an example of, of coupling with a deep learning framework, which in this case was not very successful, but you, I, I hope you got the idea. Uh, let's see what else can I show. So I, I think we have made pretty good time and we have eight minutes left instead of starting something new and just running through it. Um, I figured it might be a good time for me to just stick around and see if anybody has any, uh, has any questions or any, anything that, uh, uh you know, I can help with, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, I guess after that we can adjourn. Uh, it's, it's been a it's been a long day. I've been talking a lot, so I don't want to start anything new. Uh, uh, let me know if, uh, uh, if if anybody has any questions. Uh, I have one. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I'm a little bit confused about the workflow of the last uh, deep learning example. So I'm thinking, uh, how how do you how do we uh, use the constructed data from the deep learning fr uh, framework? So so okay. So so the deep learning framework that I demonstrated is is just is just kind of like a placeholder. So what I was doing over there is collecting say multiple snapshots of data, right? And and uh, and this data was just the uh, the velocity of the of the of the flow field, one component of the velocity, and then trying to put it into a neural network and reconstruct the data exactly. So learn the identity function, right? So the neural network takes the input data and tries to predict the output data, right? Uh -huh. uh, after collecting that initial training data for a certain number of iterations, I was running the training to compress it, right? And mm -hmm. then uh, uh, after the training was was finished, I was using the train model on new data that was coming in and just reconstructing it. Okay, just okay. trying to see okay. if I could predict it. Right. Okay. So in this case, this is a useless model. There is no use to it. Okay? okay. Okay. So so this is just to show that you know like a neural network can be deployed in open form. But okay. what you might want to do is you might want to collect data, both input and output, and train that model. Uh, after a certain amount of time and then use the model instead of the original PD. Does that yes, make sense? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, it is. Okay, cool, got okay. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi, Romit. Uh, yes. I'm wondering what the advantage here really is uh, in terms of doing things in situ instead of you just write all that. I, I mean, I agree there'll probably be savings on the writing of data. So space savings probably. But then if you just write everything and then do a deep learning, how is that different from in situ? Like why in situ basically? Uh, if you are actually, uh, you will have space savings, sure, but you will also have extreme time savings. Just to, you know, so uh, writing files to disk when you're, writing, when you're running really big simulations, sometimes your IO can be bigger than your PD compute. So it's not gonna scale well. Right. But here, the wouldn't part. the wouldn't running things in situ, wouldn't running the TensorFlow part in situ also cause an extra overhead? Every time step, you are also doing that part, right? training the data. I'm not doing it every time step. I'm doing it after a certain batch of data collection. So every okay, time step, still, the data is being collected. Yeah, right, I mean, so the it, TensorFlow overhead is is in some sense it's unavoidable, right? It will happen whether you're running it on on another machine or running out saved data or you're running it from within open form. It's more about preventing that data touching disk. And some things that we have not exp explored over here is the idea of transfer learning, idea of, uh, of retraining, right? So you have a data, you have a model that's sitting on disk. Uh, the new data comes in and you can use, you know, like online learning, adaptive learning to, to, uh, to, to transfer learning with your new model. Again, these are things that we have not shown, but these are things that can be done if you have access to a framework like this. 
so uh, so the so the biggest idea of in situ is 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 savings on uh, on uh, uh, on essentially like the movement of data right we want to make our codes as data centric as possible or keep the data in one place do everything around it rather than move the data to multiple places that's how the human brain works right data and computation are co-located in the human brain you don't have data at one place and your computer at the other that's why we are so efficient in terms of uh, uh, power versus flops so i hope that makes sense yeah, yeah. totally mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. There's a question from Alfred. How long will Romit entertain questions in Slack after the works? As long as the questions are entertaining, I will be, I will keep entertaining the questions. Let's just put it that way. No, no I'm joking. Uh, feel free to ping me uh, either in the workshop or uh, or email me uh, if, if, for example, I'm not super responsive over there. Um, I'm hoping that you know uh, it's not just me who's entertaining questions. Obviously, I will be there, uh, but other people who have who start using this and and you know get get uh, get more proficient with it? Let's just help each other out, right? That's how open formers uh, do their work. So I'm going to paste my email. My email should be in the mail that I sent uh, uh, to to all the registrations, but I'll post my email. Oh, sorry, that should be to everyone. So my email is in the chat. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, always happy to. Uh, to, to talk to other people who are interested in this in this work. So so Kathy, I don't know if if you are allowed to stick around after twelve, but if you know if uh, if people wish for me to be around for 10, 15 more minutes, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, otherwise, we can adjourn for today. <laughs>